uh, is the correct answer. Um, any of you got it? Cool season annuals are out there right now, but they're gonna die before uh, say June when the heat hits. Uh, creeping perennials, well, they live every year, but I guess the answer would technically be correct. Uh, as would um, uh, perennials, uh, but I was really looking for the answer biennials, but I could have worded the question better too. So I, I'd give credit to you for those. Uh, question number two, um, which management method would be considered, whoops, which management method would be considered a biological means of weed management? <clears throat> well, I got most of you uh, on this because I was looking for the answer goat grazing because that's using one organism to control the other organism. And um, um, but uh, competition kind of is biological management, but in the context we talked about it last week, competition is more of a cultural approach to weed management. So in other words, you're using another plant to outcompete it. In a sense, you are using one organism to outcompete another. So I get how you're thinking that, but really um, biological management of weeds or of any other pest is really thought of by using an animal or a plant or, or even a fungus or a rust or a other kind of plant disease to manage a, a weed or a, another pest issue. So uh, line trimming is totally uh, mechanical and hand pulling I put in that category too, even though we are organisms. So anyway, I, I caught you on that one. It's not important that you know the word cultural or mechanical, it's important that you understand how to manage weeds and what tools are available to you. But um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna keep moving. Um, so you can tell that if this was a final exam, I'd probably have to give you credit all over the place. Uh, but um, anyway, it's good for discussion. Which factor would not be appropriate to use in soil solarization? Uh, that would be pre-emergent herbicides uh, the clear plastic and sealing the edges of the plastic is, um, is part of the method, as are the full sun and the moist tilled soil. So that one's pretty clear and most people got that correct. Which type of mulch is most desirable for enhancing soil ecological processes? Well, an organic mulch of some kind would be the most ideal and 100% of you got that answer correctly. I, I appreciate that. What type of herbicide would be most appropriate for managing well-established creeping perennials? I caught you because uh -huh. this should be a systemic non-selective, uh, or it could be a selective systemic too, but uh, since that wasn't one of the choices, you never ever want to use a soil, a soil sterilant in your yard. A pre-emergent um, will only manage uh, weeds that have not yet germinated. And then a contact herbicide mm. is really designed for using on annuals because it burns down the top, but it does not uh, influence the root system really at all. So these systemic or translocated herbicides are the ones that would be the appropriate answer. So uh, keep thinking about that one. I don't think I'd have given a whole lot of uh, credit there. And so, um, Again, a translocated or systemic herbicide is needed for a perennial because you need it to translocate to the root system where uh, these perennial root systems of weeds often have a lot of energy stored. And then the number six is uh, basically just uh, a poll to see if you learned anything. And most people learned three to five things. I'm really happy about that. And a few learned more than five. So. Uh, weed management is something that takes a lot of time and often you might be looking at uh, uh, references to, that help guide you. So I'm going to um, go ahead and then close the, the, uh, the poll here. And because I, I would really like us to have the time to listen to this entomology presentation that I'm about to introduce. So uh, Phil McNally is with us today. He's a Yavapai County Master Gardener, and I, 
Phil, the, you took the class two years ago or has it been four? Um, two, I think it was two. two. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, Phil took the class uh, two years ago in uh, 2019. Uh, that was the last class that we met the whole time uh, face to face at, at this point in time. And uh, Phil is an entomologist by training. And when I first met him, he was working for a chemical company um, looking at pest management options and solutions uh, with that company. But also Phil has worked uh, in academia. He's uh, a faculty member at Arizona State University. And he's had a very um, interesting and um, you know, productive career. Uh, but what I would also say, and I'm sure he's going to share this with us, is Phil has a brand new book. And um, Phil has been looking into the uh, moths and butterflies in Yavapai County. And it's, a uh, well, in central Arizona, really, in the central Arizona highlands. And I'm, Phil, you're going to tell us a little bit about that project if we have time, I imagine. Okay. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Phil, welcome this morning, and um, please share any other things from your background you'd like to share with folks, and I so much appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. Let's see here. Um, yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to add a whole lot. I think you covered pretty well. Thanks. Yeah, I was uh, in extension for seven years, um, Arizona and, and California, beginning of my career, and then after that, I, I went to work for Bayer and work with the development of, of organic and conventional uh, pest control products, that sort of thing. But all the while I've, I've kept my interest in, in natural history as well. So um, it's, it's kind of a hybrid um, involvement I've had with, with entomology. Um, let's see here. Um, I'm just getting out of the way. I'll mention my book a little bit later, but <clears throat> since I uh, have the opportunity to push it, here it is. It, I finally got an advanced copy out of Asia. Um, I have a website, which I'll show you a little bit later if you're interested in, in, um, in looking at it, but it's not going to be available probably for about three or four weeks, but it's basically centered on uh, the butterflies of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the highlands. So that's between Kingman, um, uh, Prescott area, Camp Verde, Payson, and then over to the San Carlos and um, Apache Indian lands to the border. So it's below the Mugian Ram and above the uh, Sonoran and Mojave Desert, which is an area that's been really ignored by a lot of people. But this is the book and got 500 photos of all sorts of uh, butterflies, 185 of them in this area, believe it or not, 185. And um, anyway, it's kind of a little interesting thing. If you're interested, you can go to the website. So that's my plug for my book. Uh, also, I wanted to, um, to relate to you a couple other references that may be of interest to you for insects in general. And uh, one of them here is Kaufman's Field Guide to Insects of North America. Uh, really excellent book, pretty general, but, but covers a lot, covers a lot of, and a lot of things that are here. Um, I'll get into butterflies and moths in the talk, but as you know, if you're looking at the the um, pest stages of these things, it's mostly the larvae. And this is an excellent book on the larvae or caterpillars of moths and butterflies in the home and garden. And this is by uh, Tom Allen, Jim Brock and Glassberg. Really, really good book as well. And then lastly, a general text, which is actually written reasonably, um, uh, easily to read, I would say. It's, it's a textbook for college, but it's, it's done in a, in a more of a layperson type format, which I like, and it's called Bugs Rule. It's a little more expensive, but it's a really good book as well. So um, if you guys need more information, co contact Jeff, or um, you can contact me and I can send those references out or by email or whatever, we can list them, okay? All right, so let's see, I'll share the screen here. Um, All right, I'm hoping you guys can see that. Jeff, does that, is that coming through? Coming through perfectly. Thanks so much, Phil. Okay, great. All righty. So um, 
thanks to Jeff for a lot of help and it's a lot of material and a lot of his photos. I've incorporated the talks that he's been given for the last heavens. I don't know what it's been now, 20 years, Jeff. <laughs> he's been doing this a while. So I've incorporated his presentation and, and mine. Uh, oh yeah, I also wanted to add, I, I suspect Jeff and Mary have, have already mentioned this to you, you guys, but Jeff has put together a really nice compendium of uh, one page information sheets on practically everything you want to know about horticulture and pest control and you name it um, um, in Yavapai County. And he calls it the backyard gardener. And uh, I've looked at it. I found stuff in there that's of interest I didn't know. And friends of mine as well have uh, from all over the place have uh, accessed this thing. It's very, very comprehensive. So uh, I really strongly advise you guys to uh, have a look at it because there's a lot of other things in here that uh, are very, you know, really good. And for instance, um, it goes back to 1998. So yeah, so Jeff's been doing this a while. I just looked at the 2021 entries and he's still going strong and keeping it up to date. This is from, I think, March, what, 24th on pine needle scale. So uh, it, it's current and very comprehensive. So I strongly recommend you guys also check that for additional references and information. All right, we'll move on to the talk then. So uh, what is the importance of insects? Uh, and also um, arthropods in, in our world today. They're disease vectors, and very important with you know, malaria, Western Nile, Zika, encephalitis. Those are mostly mosquito transmitted, but also Rocky Mountain spotted fever, just by ticks and Chagas disease and, and, and several others as well. Um, cockroaches have been implicated with tremendous allergies in inner city uh, homes. And so there's a lot of asthma problems that have been associated with cockroaches, especially German cockroaches. They're agriculture and ornamental pest, we're familiar with that. Also structural pest. But a lot of beneficial impacts as well. The pollinators and seed distributors. Uh, carpenter, it's not carpenter, harvester ants, for instance, are very effective seed distributors of, of some of our native plants. Other biological control agents as predators and parasitoids. They produce honey, silk, shellac, and dye. Uh, they're also important in the food chain for a lot of animals higher up the food chain. And of course, we're seeing more insect related foods coming on the market, and especially in the third world, it's much more prominent in their diets. Uh, they're macro decomposers recycle nutrients and uh, are also important in, in, uh, in forming soil and, and, uh, and, and forming uh, uh, more permeable soils as well. Subjects of art, you've seen a lot of that. And also recently, there's a lot of ecotourism programs going on now related to uh, butterfly uh, photography. All right, so what is an insect? Well, let's start off and think about backbones. Do insects have backbones? No, they don't. They have an exoskeleton. Their structure is derived from the cuticle. So that gets rid of certain critters here. Um, so they're invertebrates. Do insects have jointed appendages? Yes, they do. So that gets rid of echinoderms, starfish, and sponges and uh, mollusk and earthworms. So now we're down to this group. And these, this group are arthropods. So arthropods basically means jointed appendages. So these are all arthropods. So how many legs do insects have? Well, they have six as we know. And so you'll see beetles and bees and butterflies and moths, caddisflies, grasshoppers have six, but Crawdads and spiders and scorpions and millipedes have more than six legs. How many body segments do insects have? Three, right? A head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So that eliminates these guys. These guys have two body segments, a cephalothorax and an abdomen. Same as spiders, same as scorpions. And these guys just have a head and, and an abdomen. 
those are millipedes. Okay, so that's what an insect is. It's the class Hexopoda, meaning six legs or insecta. Some scientists call them insecta as well. So there's a whole bunch of different types of insects. They fall into orders that we'll get into in much more detail a little bit later. So insects vary greatly in size. This, this is a little triple gramma, a little micro wasp that parasitizes eggs, insect eggs. So this thing is probably a millimeter, a millimeter and a half in length, very small. But you also have some real large representatives. You have um, some of these tropical moths that can get up to about uh, 12 inches or so. We have a Titania, Titanius longhorn beetle. These are both in the tropics. Uh, this is almost about, I don't know, six to eight inches, I believe, it's quite large as well. So th those are the extremes. If you go back and look at some of our history, do you have dragonflies? This one is a Meganeura dragonfly that was had a wingspan of, of 28 inches or so. So quite gigantic, but that one's gone obviously now. But remember in the 50s, there was some discovery of some gigantic ants. That's my joke. All right, moving on, insect growth and development. There's three, or we may say four, as I'll get into in a second, types of development based on the appearance of the second stage, which is the nymph. All insects have eggs and an adult stage. Some of them have a nymphal stage and some of them have a, have a larval and a pupal stage. So if they just have a nymphal stage here on the left that looks very similar to the adult, there's basically no metamorphosis going on. So it's called a metabolus. If you've got a nymphal stage, then it's called the gradual metamorphosis or hemimetabolus, which you find in roaches and cicadas and aphids and um, some other odds and ends that we'll talk about. If it's got the larval stage, pupil stage, and adult stage, then it's called holometabolus or complete metamorphosis. Um, if you guys haven't read the section of entomology in the handbook that you have, uh, it's a good review for you to do so on page 175 to 198. This is covered in there as well. So I mentioned that there's some scientists recently have uh, discerned a fourth type in metamorphosis. So the science never stays static. And um, Rutherford and Truman just two years ago during doing a lot of genetic analysis, but also some tissue work where they found that thrips, believe it or not, have a strange semi-larval, semi-nymphal stage, semi-pupal stage, that's it's quiescent. So it, it's not like a pupa in that, you know, the pupa is so different looking than the larvae, like you see in butterflies and moths and beetles. It looks more like a nymph, like what you see in grasshoppers or in cicadas or aphids. But those stages in the grasshoppers and aphids and such are all mobile. They're, they're not quiescent, they're not, they're not stationary. But for some reason, these stages here for thrips are like a pupa in that they don't move, they're, they're quiescent. And after other work was done with, by Truman and Rufer, they found that, that these, these stages really don't have much in the way of any analog to some of these other insects. So they had to come up with a new name, which they did. <clears throat> and so now it's Neometabolus for thrips. So that's new, <laughs> new information. Okay, so how are insects classified? Well, uh, the first one to come up with a conventional binomial, that is two name, um, naming system for a species was Carl Linnaeus. And he um, established a hierarchical grouping ba based on kingdoms, phylums, class, orders, family, genus, and species. He was the first one to really come up with that. Before it was all over the place. Some species were regarded as families and 
and uh, it, was, it was just and wasn't consistent. So he came up with this in the early 1700s and it stuck and, and it's a system that we've retained today. So let's look at an example of that. Let's look at the honeybee, for example. It's in the animal kingdom. And then under that kingdom, there's different phyla. And for instance, uh, earthworms would be in the, the phylum Annelida and seashells are in the phylum Mollusca. Well, insects and spiders, as we talked about earlier, they're in the phylum Arthropoda. Okay, so we're going to the next level below that. We have insects, which we talked about, insecta or hexapoda. And then we get into orders, and that's where they start breaking out. And so bees, wasps, and ants will be under the order Hymenoptera. Another order, for instance, would be Lepidoptera for butterflies and moths, or order Coleoptera for beetles and so on. And as my talk progresses, I'm going to address the different insects that we come in contact with by order. So within the order, we have families. We have APD for bees. And there's maybe five or six different types of bees, or different families of bees, like megachylids or, or uh, um, minor bees or digger wasps, um, excuse me, digger bees. And there's different other bee families, not just honeybees. The genus is Apis and the species mellifera. So that's, that's the classification system. All right, so we're gonna go into the orders now. The first one is Lepidoptera. There's about 150,000 species worldwide. The development is, is uh, holometabolous, that is four stages. Wings are covered in scales, hence the name Lepid meaning scales, Optera meaning wings, so scale wings. The mouth parts, the adults have a siphoning proboscis, the larvae, the larval man, um, uh, larval food, and uh, well, I guess most of them have mandible. There are some primitive ones. I don't want to get too complicated. The primitive ones actually don't even have any mouth parts at all, but the vast majority have mandibles, hence cause a lot of the damage on plants. Antennae are knobbed for butterflies, feathery or thread-like for mobs and hooked for skippers. All right, here's our some examples of some pests that we encounter here. Two of them are the tomato and uh, tobacco hornworms. And uh, these larvae can get up to two to three inches easily. And um, so they can be pretty damaging. damaging. I'm sure some of you have seen these on tomatoes. So um, they get on, Solanaceous plants, so that includes not just tomatoes, but peppers and eggplants and potatoes as well. So for management, uh, the best thing to do is destroy or remove the debris that they could be overwintering in. Um, and also you need to watch during this growing season to see if you see these little pellets at the base of the plant, which indicate that that's the excrement and there's some worm activity going on. You can see here, there's looks like the worms have cut off this this uh, stem here and there as well. So if you can find the larvae, you can simply hand remove them because often you, you only find maybe one or two in a plant at best, you can hand remove them. But if you don't see them or you've got a, an extensive uh, stand of tomatoes or uh, peppers or whatever, then you may want to use a, a chemical, pyrethroids, uh, bacillus or spinosins, uh, another good one. Uh, with bacillus, it's not effective on as effective on more mature larvae. Okay, here's another example of a pest in Lepidoptera. It's a peach tree borer. Here, this is the adult, and then here's the larval, the damaging form. And um, so they'll attack at the base of the trees, and uh, it can cause uh, some wilting and and uh, problems with the vascular uh, conduction. So there are pheromones that have been uh, developed to monitor these guys. You, you can buy them at organic supply places uh, here in the state or outside. So the best thing is to monitor these, the flight of these guys using these traps. And then um, when you detect the adults flying, then spray this trunk with a pyrethroid and that'll protect the, the trunk from attack. 
Okay, we also have um, uh, pitch moths here and let me get this out of the way. Let's see, my screen is better, that's better. Um, and so th they'll attack the crotches um, and also wounds on trees. And um, you'll see a lot of this exudate here or exudate here. Let's see. For some reason, I'm freezing up. Hold on here. Hmm. There we go. Okay. So here's some uh, resin or pitch exudates from the sequoia pitch moth. See, that's pretty severe. Different species of pines have different susceptibilities. And if you look at the lower ones here, these are the ones that are more susceptible to pitch moth. In other words, these are the ones that you may not want to plant if we've got pitch moth in the area. A Scotch pine, Austrian pine is pretty common here. Um, Jeffrey, um, ones that are least resist on a Monterey and Mugo, Italian stone, um, Ponderosa. There aren't any natural enemies known, uh, at least of significance for the pitch moth. For cultural control, again, you can monitor the adult activity with pheromone traps. And I think this is very important because this is also a strategy used for disease prevention um, that, that you're here. I don't think you guys have had pathology yet, but you hear about that later. Um, it's, it's really a good idea to try to prune your, your trees when the pest or disease is not active or not you know, in, the, in the infective or an infesting stage. So for the pitch moth, that would be after the adults have flown, which is later in the fall and the winter. So you keep these traps out. And when, um, if, if you've got them flying, then you wait till they're not flying anymore. And that would be the time to prune. Also try to keep the vigor up. So um, try to maintain adequate irrigation. And uh, if you really got lots of time in your hand, you can try to physically remove the resin masses and physically kill the larvae. No known chemical control to my knowledge on this. I say that besides, this is, we talk about chemical control. Now I'll just leave it at that. I won't get into it any further. And then once again, if you wanna uh, know a little bit more about the butterflies, the adult butterflies in this area, this is the book that's coming out. It's gonna be out in, in April. And you can go to um, Central Arizona Butterflies or Central Arizona Highlands Butterflies on the website and you can, you can uh, learn more about that book. Okay, the next order is Coleoptera, the beetles. And this is a very large group, over 350,000 species have been named and there's probably another couple hundred thousand species that haven't. It also has a complete metamorphosis. So you have the egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The forewing is very thick and opaque and the coleoptera is, means sheath wing. And this is like a sheath with the um, outer wings there. The hind wing, which you can't see, is membranous. Um, the mouth parts for both adults and larvae are mandibular. The, big chewing guys, and the antenna can be serrated to uh, capitate with, with knobs or smooth or filiform, very, quite variable. Here's an example that we have here called dung beetle, very beautiful uh, species, it's not damaging, but you'll find it um, uh, around dung piles. And, um, if you're curious to collect some of these guys and some other interesting beetles, a real interesting little hobby that I've gotten into is putting out traps in the ground, called pitfall traps. And then you can put various baits in there for dung beetles. You can use feces and, and uh, you'll especially like something, they tend to go towards, um, well, they go to, to both feces like heavily protein containing feces and also some 
uh, more vegetative stuff. They'll, they'll go to both. Um, a lot of beetles will also go to fermenting products. So you can put wine out in these traps and you attract uh, all sorts of odds and ends. And you can put these in the deep in the soil there and cover them, leave spaces for the insects to get in there. I did this a couple of years ago with, um, actually I didn't even use a bait for these guys. I just put some um, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol rather, uh, in a cup and put it in the uh, ground, let, let it there for about 14 days. And these are all the, the creatures that found their way into that. You may see this around, especially uh, as we get into the forest. And these are um, pleasing fungus beetles. You can see these links around Lynx Lake and, and that area in the Bradshaws. Um, they feed on fungi. And so they're, they're basically not damaging to, to us. Very beautiful beetle. Now we have blister beetles. And these are very interesting because um, the immature stages are parasitic on grasshoppers and also bees. But you find the adults on flowers and leaves. And of course, the adults will be on flowers and they may be laying their eggs there. And then the larvae will be there. And then when the bees will come to pollinate or get a nectar source, then the larvae of these beetles will hitch a ride and uh, follow the bees to their nest and, and then um, de develop from there. They also secrete um, an irritating compound, hence the name blister beetles. It's called cantharidin. And some of the stuff can, can cause some minor irritation and, and some of it doesn't, but just to be aware of that. Um, some that can cause some problems um, can build up sometimes in alfalfa. And if they are harvested, the beetles are harvested with the alfalfa and then fed to cattle, they can cause some problems with their digestive tract. So for management, there are natural enemies out there, but once again, they're not of significance. Uh, for cultural control, depending on the size of the crops that you know, you're, you're planting, you can have physical barriers to try to keep them out. Um, here's a little timing thing where you can try to, if you're gonna have alfalfa, harvest and cut your alfalfa before you get the peak bloom because the blister beetles will tend to come to the flowers and that will hopefully avoid the maximum period of activity of these guys. And then if you have to spray them, there's several materials out there that you can use. Penicate beetles, this is the Tenebrionidae group. They are um, non-damaging. They basically live on plant matter, mostly dead plant matter. Um, when disturbed, they're stand on their head like you see here. Um, they also have a little irritating chemical that they're sprayed to ward off predators. And, um, Sometimes you can, you can smell that. If you pick them up, you'll see that. Um, much more active at night. You go out at sunset and um, into the evening where you may have run across one or two or three during the day, you may run across 10 or 20 or in the case where I've been out in the, the dunes out by Glamis, out by Yuma, you can see hundreds of them coming out after sunset. So it's pretty interesting. And there's several species probably in our area, there's probably 10 to 15 species at least. Here's the agave snout weevil. And uh, this is a damaging one, thanks to Jeff for these photos. This will attack agaves. We'll get into the heart and you'll see you'll, you'll die it back, or knock it back quite a bit and eventually kill it. Um, natural enemies, not significant. Uh, basically the only thing you can really do is, is just remove and destroy the infested plants and try to get rid of the source of the infestation. And um, one thing I can think about is chemical control is, is tequila. These are the, often the uh, larvae you see in tequila, even though there's a, there's a bunch of others they, that they throw in there as well. Now we have flea beetles. They're very small, probably about a uh, quarter of an inch at best. And uh, they can build up on high numbers. They have a wide host range and they love to attack newly emerging plants. You see them in some older ones too, but they're especially damaging 
on newly emerging plants. There are some parasitic wasps out there, but once again, not of great significance. Because of their wide host range, they can build up populations on weeds and then move from the weeds onto the agricultural crop. So it's a real good idea to control the weeds, try to knock down those alternate hosts. Uh, also, exclusion is very effective. If you can keep the um, vegetables that you're growing covered, that can help quite a bit too. They're pretty susceptible to just about every insecticide out there. So um, if you need to spray them, they're pretty easily, pretty easy to kill. All right, uh, we have the elm leaf beetle. And um, you'll see the, the damage it can do. It can defoliate quite a bit. Um, these are larvae here. Of course, there's the adult. There are some braconid wasps that'll attack it and um, lay plenty of eggs on these things. But um, usually when you see the parasitoids attacking the beetles, it's after the beetles have built up to some pretty large populations. So these are the, some of the natural enemies out there. There's quite a few, but once again, it's not, uh, they're, they're usually too late to the, to the show to have an effect. <clears throat> Cultural control, if you can tolerate some damage and they don't build up too high, then just kind of let it go. Uh, for chemical control, you can try the bark banding. Uh, you can try the bacillus. Once again, more effective on larvae. Bacillus is generally, most insecticides generally are more effective on larvae, except maybe pyrethroids. Pyrethroids are pretty good on adults. So timing is important for a lot of insect pests to get them in the larval stage and especially the young larval stage. Uh, neem is a nice little organic material, that's good. And then there's also systemics out there. Now in the forest, you see a lot of wood that's got various holes of different shapes and sizes. And uh, one group is called the round-headed borers because the larval stage is round. And when they emerge, um, you'll see these round holes. And this is the giant root borer, which we have here. And these guys are quite large. They're probably uh, up to three inches. And the larvae is also about three inches. He's a pretty good size. Um, this is reasonably distinctive from some of the others in that you see these very strong spines on the sides of the thorax. But the size is also pretty distinctive. So they live on oaks, cottonwoods, and fruit trees. A lot of these you'll, you'll see come in the lights at night. Um, basically root feeders, and they can cause some dieback, especially in younger trees. In the older trees, it's not much of a problem. And once again, for management, there's not much you can do besides just, you know, hopefully plant some other type of plants that they're not feeding on. They've been seen in fruit trees. Um, I'm not sure how common they are. I've, I've seen them in actually, uh, uh, infest citrus over in Southern California out by Temecula. They have an infestation of these things, very strange. <clears throat> but they get in fruit trees as well. And um, here we have the female of this giant root borer and the male. You can see the difference in sizes and also the difference in the shape. The male is more stout, it's got a, a wider and more serrated antenna. And uh, with a lot of insects, the males may have a larger and more uh, developed antenna because they'll have more receptors on there to detect pheromones from the female. We see this in moths tremendously, and we see this in other things like these beetles as well. Another round headed boar is the ponderous boar, which we also have um, here in, in town. And um, it lives in dead stumps, trunks, and, and roots, basically in pine. So we're going to see that more on the southern side of town. The Palo Verde borer is probably going to be found 
in Yavapai County down towards Camp Verde in the lower elevations because it's on Palo Verde. Um, but also mesquites and um, say some oaks and poplar grapes and citrus, but um, I think in grapes, I've, I've heard of it attacking grapes, but in, in our area, I think it's the main host are gonna be mesquites and Palo Verdes, um, even though occasionally, I guess you will find them in oaks and poplars. I've never seen them up here. Jeff, have you seen Palo Verde borders up, uh, borders up in Prescott? You know, I, I have not, Phil. Um, uh, you know, and, and I am not an expert enough to be able to identify them from, uh, from the, the other oak root borer or the, you know, the giant borer that you showed too. So, but they're big, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they're they're big like them. the other one. The, the antenna is, doesn't have the spines on it. That's one way of differentiating them. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of beetles, but these are the two of the largest ones. Um, but yeah, um, I, I haven't seen them either in Olson Poplars or up here. Sometimes you can count the number of spines. I don't want to get into it, but the number of these spines it can be distinctive for some of these. Uh, but it can cause some, some problems um, with younger trees, especially, but some dieback with the older trees because you're the big guys. Now, there's a host of other round headed boars. Most of them aren't of significance, but they're they're quite uh, beautiful looking things. Um, and these are all ones, I believe these are all Yavapai County beetles that I've run across. There's this uh, one here called the banded ash boar, which uh, has been found in uh, firewood. And I think Jeff had a, uh, some individual that reported it to him coming out of Dewey. Um, but it's basically just a firewood inhabitor. So those are round headed boars. Another group is called the flat-headed boars because their heads are more elliptical versus round. And you'll see the exit holes of these guys is more elliptical as well. So that can kind of give you an idea. Um, if you look under the bark, you see these, these broad tunnels. And you'll also see that with round-headed boars as well. But this is completely different than what you see with bark beetles, which I'll get into in just a little bit. The galleries are completely different. Bark beetles are probably one-tenth the size or one-fifteenth the size. So the galleries are much more and detailed and much smaller. Uh, here's what the larval form looks like there. Um, let's see here. So this is one that you've heard about. We're having an outbreak here in the area and it's um, a ponderosa pine bark beetle or the Ips engraver beetle. And um, it's starting to take out quite a few trees here. And I guess we had an attack back, I think Jeff said back in 2003, 2004 as well. And they're really uh, associated with attacking stress trees. And the two causes of stress in our area, these pine trees, are uh, drought and um, stands that are too thick. Both of these factors relate to competition for water or the lack of enough water and adequate water to keep these pines healthy. Because if they're healthy and they've got uh, adequate moisture in their trunk, they will tend to, what we say, pitch out a lot of the beetles um, in which here's some pitch here and this one's actually infested. But um, if it's got a lot of moisture a lot of these the beetles cannot necessarily attack and get established nearly as easily as they can in a water stressed uh, tree so that's the main thing is to provide adequate moisture for your trees and make sure they're not stressed but if you um, uh, want to spray them you can try spraying them with a pyrethroid or carboreal but you've got to spray uh, you know, almost the entire trunk. And you may have to have some professional people with equipment to be able to, to, to do that because you need some, some good high powered spray equipment to get up in that area and the higher reaches of the tree. There's a new material, we're out to be, I think it's been around since 2014 or 15 called emamectin benzoate, which can be um, injected and um, it's a systemic. And it has been shown, at least according to the manufacturers, to provide, they say, up to two years of protection 
But protection is, is the key word here because if you've got an infestation already going, this material is not that effective because often the infestation will disrupt some of the vascular movement of the uh, liquids inside the, the uh, tree. And so you won't get this translocation as well. And so it's not as, as good. So you've got to hedge your bet. And if you're going to use this material, you have to inject before you have an infestation. If you've got the infestation, then there's really nothing you can do about it. So that's the uh, Ips engraver beetle. There's another one we have that I mentioned about the bark beetles. That was a small bark beetle. Yeah, five millimeters. Five millimeters is about what? What? Uh, a fifth of an inch, right? So it's pretty pretty small compared to those beetles that are the flat-headed and round-headed uh, boars that are anywhere from one inch to three inches. These guys are a fifth of an inch. So this guy's even a little bit smaller. And this will get on juniper and it gets into the twigs here. And here are the galleries. And most of these bark beetles have galleries of different patterns, but of similar size and width of the tunnels. So very small, quite small. And um, so these guys can, can kill uh, Arizona cypress and, and Leland cypress as well. So as far as management is concerned, once again, it's, it's, it's one of these vigor things. Try to make sure that your trees are not stressed at all. You can try the trunk sprays like for the other bark beetles. And um, this may be possible. I have not seen it in the label specifically for cypress bark, but there's a lot of different bark beetles on their label. And once again, it's gonna have to be a preventative type application. So the, the strategy is very similar to the ponderosa pine beetle. Some of you may have seen this, this guy, it's called a fig beetle. And it's about oh, almost an inch in size. And um, the larvae will live in mulch and also lawn clipping piles. They love that stuff. Uh, but then the adults will go out looking for, for sap and especially maybe fermenting sap. And um, so they will attack fruit and uh, they can cause quite a bit of damage if, if they build up in high numbers. The best thing you can do is like uh, managing birds, just try to put some netting out there and exclude them from uh, getting access to the fruit. And also if you've got grass or mulch, just uh, you know, make sure you don't have beetles in there. And if they do and you want to get rid of them, then you'd have to spread that mulch out or spread the grass out. There's some other ones that we have in the area that are quite beautiful and quite large, uh, but uh, they basically live on oak for the most part, I believe. And um, you've got quite a bit of oak and they, they've survived here, you know, forever with these guys. But I've got the Hercules beetle, the ox beetle, and rhinoceros beetles. These all will start showing up at lights from the end of July to the end of August in the area here. But once again, uh, they're not damaging. And this, once again, this thing is, can be up to three inches in length. They're a good size. Okay, so that was Coleoptera, the beetles. So now we're gonna move over to the flies, which is in the order Diptera. Diptera means two wings, which refers to these prominent wings here. Uh, but there's actually four wings, but the hind wings are modified. That's what these little guys are here. And they're called halters. And um, these organs basically help the insect orient when it's flying. So it's, they vibrate and it's almost like a gyroscope for them. So that's what a fly will have. And there's other insects that will look very similar to flies. Uh, but if you look carefully, they will not have these modified hind wings. This is um, another group that has the four stages in the development, an egg stage, a larval stage, a pupil stage, and an adult stage. So the adult mouth parts um, are quite variable. They can be sponging, lapping, or piercing. Like stable flies would be piercing. Uh, there's several uh, uh, also, of course, mosquitoes are going to be have piercing mouth parts as well. And then you've got house flies that'll be more lapping or spongy, that sort of thing. 
larvae can be legless. They can have little hooks. Um, I'm sorry for the mouth parts. They, um, they have hooks or stipends. This one uh, is a, I think it's a crane fly. It looks like, I think it has hooks on that. The larvae basically are legless. So we've got mosquitoes and we also got midges. And I live close to Willow Lake and in the uh, evenings at sunset, there'll be huge swarms of these flies and their midges, they're not mosquitoes that are there. But um, the difference, the easy, the, the easy way to tell the difference between these guys is to look, if you catch them, look at the proboscis that, this piercing proboscis that mosquitoes have well, midges don't have that at all. And if you really want to get into the details, um, the wings here have a lot of little CD or hairs on them on the mosquitoes and the, uh, the midges don't. The mosquitoes, of course, are implicated with tons of different disease uh, transmissions and midges do not. Now, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, flies, maggots, there's, um, a lot of species of these guys, very important in, in decomposition. There's a joke. All right, we move on to uh, Hemiptera, aphids, white flies, cicadas, and so on. Uh, there's 82,000 species at least of, of known named uh, individuals. And uh, the development is is hemimetabolism. So we covered the four orders. There's just a couple more that, that have complete metamorphosis, but that's, those are the main ones. Most of these others I'm gonna talk about will have, uh, it will be called hemimetabolism or the three stages, an egg and nymph and adult stage. So the wings are, are clear. Um, they're held roof-like over the bodies. That would be aphids, leaf hoppers, and homoptera, or it can be, half pigmented and half clear, which is a subgroup called the heteroptera, or the true bugs. Or lastly, they can be completely wingless, as in bed bugs. So the mouth parts can be sucking, such as what we find in aphids, um, and cicadas, and leaf hoppers, and so on, or piercing, such as we see in bed bugs. The antenna are straight, and then once again, the uh, examples are aphids, leaf hoppers, uh, also white flies, psyllids, and all these guys are important disease vectors. Here's one that's active right now. I'm seeing a little bit of it around. That's a box elder bug. They're gonna be obviously more common as we go on. Um, We've also got milkweed bugs, which we'll see later, but these, this is the difference between the two. And um, you'll see the, the difference here is this prominent orange with this black band, and here it's, it's basically just black with, with some um, orange venation on that half wing. So these, these are the, the ones that have the half wings. Half the wing is, is uh, pigmented and the other half is clear. The same here too, half the wing is is pigmented in half of it's clear. So these are on box elders. Of course, these are on, on milkweeds. Um, for box elder management, there, there are enemies out there, but these box elder bugs can develop into some really high populations. And so they're not really gonna be of significance once again. <clears throat> the best thing you can do is don't plant box elders if you're concerned about having box elder bugs around, but they're not a real big deal. But if you don't want them, don't plant box elders. Um, they will come to the house, so the best thing is to try to exclude them. Screen windows, caulking, window stripping, and, and that sort of thing. Not really recommended to do any kind of chemical control. I've never heard of a box elder bug population killing a box elder tree. But uh, once again, they're a nuisance. So if you don't like them, I suppose you could, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, squash bugs. This is a damaging one here. Um, let me get a lot of water. Excuse me for a second. <clears throat> All right, they feed on squash, watermelon, pumpkins, uh, zucchini, not quite as preferred. But the damage is uh, leaf yellowing, 
running and is dieback necrosis, like what you'll see here. You can get a wilt, which can kill young plants especially. And then also if it gets on the fruit, you'll see fruit scarring. And if the fruit is young, the fruit can abort. So they can be pretty damaging. They build up in crop debris. So sanitation is, is important um, to try to get rid of them so they don't reinfest the following season. Uh, exclusion is once again, a, a kind of a repeating theme here, but this is another pest where exclusion can have an effect, <clears throat> a beneficial effect. Um, and if none of this is working for you, then there are various insecticides that, that uh, are available to be used. Um, if you're growing other cucurbits besides squash, you're not that interested in, in squash, you could use squash as a plant trap, uh, as a trap crop to be planted, because these guys tend to go to, to a squash. So that's an option. All right, another group in this Hemiptera heteroptera group is the, the pinion scale, which we have in town. And um, this is another one of these, these pests that is a little more damaging when your tree is under water stress. Um, they can cause death of the tree. You see a lot of defoliation and browning of the needles. So um, if you're not, if you're in an area where you're not watering these trees and you want the trees to survive on their own, um, <clears throat> try to make sure that the soil is, is good and, and uh, you're not going to be putting these trees in an in a area that may lead to, to water stress. Um, you can try to prune off infested limbs. That's a, that's a good try because uh, sometimes these infestations are localized on the tree. So you can try that. Um, also, if you want to use chemicals, there are several out there. Dimethylate um, is a foliar one, systemic once again, so it's absorbed, which is good. Um, a soil systemic like a neonic is, is good. A trunk injection that we know, imamectin benzoate, is, it's on the label. It allegedly works for these guys as well. But whenever you're using these, trunk or soil uh, um, systemics, you have to make sure that you've got ample water flow and irrigation to ensure that the materials are going to be either taken up by the roots or be translocated from the trunk injection up into the needles. So once again, if, if the tree's under water stress then um, and the soil's dry, then those systemics won't work at all. And um, you don't have to worry about pollinators. Some of these neonics have been implicated with uh, problems with bees and all, and that's for the most part from foliar sprays. Um, and, and that would not be a problem if you're using a systemic and pine, and pollinators don't go to pine anyway. Hey, Phil. Yeah. The, the one other thing that I would add here is that um, usually around the end of February, beginning of March, is when we find the egg masses and sanitation of those egg masses can get you a long ways in limiting how many numbers you have too. So they're, they're very uh, distinctive. They kind of look like cottony material. And if you just rake them up or even high pressure hose the tree, the bark areas on the tree to get them there, collect them and try and put them, you know, put them in a bag and get rid of them. That's pretty effective uh, mm. also. And so, but you know, there, this is a serious pest in the Prescott area. It's starting to show up in Sedona. And once the tree gets it, you really have to watch closely if you really want to try and save that tree. Have, have the pruning strategies worked? Or have they been that localized that that works? Um, not, not typically. Usually they're on the entire tree. And, and the real problem is that they kill off the previous year's needles. So then there's no photosynthetic area to, you know, create, mm. you know, storage and energy for the tree. And so it, it just diminishes in vigor over time. And uh, the other, I mean, there's a long discussion here, but 
uh, you might ask the question, well, is pinyon pine really suited to the elevation that Prescott is? And with climate change, I think the answer is going to be no. So, so anyway, no. sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. No, that's good. No, I, no, I appreciate that. So you're, are you saying that we shouldn't be planting pinyon pine? Uh, I'm not saying that uh, people, you know, people that plant them generally irrigate them and, and take good care of them. But if you have them on your property and you want to try and save them, just pick two or three individuals that you would be able to invest in and, and just let the other ones go. Because if you've got acreage, uh, chances are this pest is widespread on your acreage. On my two acres, I, I just don't worry about pinion pines anymore. Okay, thanks. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, sure, sure thing. Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. All right, here's another group. This is more medical importance here. It's um, called assassin bugs or, or kissing bugs. And this is once again, is that Hemiptera heteroptera group that's got the half of the wing is pigmented and the other half is not. <clears throat> but you'll notice this mouth part is not necessarily a sucking mouth part. It's a piercing sucking mouth part. And um, there's a couple species that have been implicated with the um, vectoring of Chagas disease. Chagas disease is much more common in Latin America where these cone nose or kissing bugs are, are much more common as well. So um, it's been moving up here in the last decade, decade or so. Um, it was locally seen, I think in the Southern states, early on, but now it's, it's moving up further. I'll show you a map a little bit, but um, 300 cases, 300,000 cases have now been recorded in the US. So it's definitely becoming, uh, you know, more of a, more of a problem. Um, there are some natural reservoirs, including opossums and raccoons, armadillos and rodents as well. So Chagas disease is kind of a nasty thing. Um, there's two phases. There's an acute phase and a chronic phase. So the acute phase is what you know, happens in the short term where you have this local redness and you get fever, rash, you get swollen lymph nodes, excuse me, swollen lymph nodes, um, headache, muscle aches, fatigue, vomiting, and diarrhea. So it's like flu. It can be like, you know, basically appear like a lot of other things, especially like the swollen uh, lymph nodes, which is, I say nymph, that's supposed to be lymph nodes, excuse me, the swollen lymph nodes. Um, so it, it uh, can mask as, as other appearing diseases when in fact it could be this, this Chagas disease. But it gets even worse as it, it gets more established in the body. Uh, it can go to the heart, cause myopathy, eventual death, and cause neurological problems, dig digestive disorders, it can be just a just a real nasty thing, so it's something to be concerned about. Now these are three species that we have in Arizona of these kissing bugs, and it's not known if these are the vectors. They have, people have not tested them to know. <clears throat> the one that is known is this thing called Triatoma sanguisuga. And this is the critter right here. And um, I don't have the date of this, but this is the current or uh, relatively current distribution of this kissing bug. And it's starting to show up in urban areas, especially in the Northeast here. And, um, or, you know, it's not sure that, that the increase in the number of cases has to do with the the um, the vector moving north or the reservoir that is uh, infected people moving north. You would think that if that was the case, you'd see more in incidents over here in the west in the United States as well, in the Southwest. But um, that hasn't been the case yet. So anyway, that's something to look out for with these kissing bugs. All righty. So um, here's some damage on this twig. Anybody recognize what this might be? A 
this was caused by a cicada laying eggs on this twig. So the, the adults will, will, um, will feed by piercing um, and deriving fluids from, from forbs or grasses, and then later on young twigs, uh, but the overposition, the egg laying is what causes this damage here too. But the nymphs will be in the, uh, the ground feeding on roots. And of course, you've heard about the seven year and what, 14 year and all these different year cicadas that, that come up out of the ground. And I think this year, the East is having a major emergence or they're expected to have a major emergence coming up. So this is what these guys look like. And when they come out of the ground, they'll, they'll either come up on little plants or you'll see them coming up on the trunk of trees. Sometimes you can see 50 to 100 of, of these cast skins um, on the trunks of trees. But we've got several species in Arizona. Um, one of the main ones is, is the Grand Western Cicada, which is this guy here. Um, associated with cottonwoods, box elder, Siberian elm. I've seen these guys over at Willow Lake in the summertime <clears throat> in July, August. Pretty good numbers. One we have here is, a, is an annual one. So two, I've seen two prominent ones. This is the, the main one, but I've seen some smaller ones over in, in the Skull Valley. And uh, their call is, is quite a bit different than the ones here. The ones here is more prolonged, while the ones over there are just clicks, not prolonged at all, completely different. And curiously, there's been some work done on cicadas that they're finding different species that look exactly alike, but, and they, they live in the same area, but they have a, a different call. And so um, they, um, they separate and they're reproductively isolated basically on, on their calls, on the base of their calls. All right, so we'll move, move into the uh, Orthoptera, Mantoidea, and Phasmatoidea group, which is grasshoppers and mantids and katydids and walking sticks. And uh, this has still a pretty good sized group. We see Orthoptera, the grasshoppers, and katydids, over 25,000 species uh, identified to date or so far. Um, the mantids, curiously enough, are, there's over 3,000 species of them described. They're pretty prominent in the tropics. And then walking sticks as well. Three stages in the development, egg, nymph, and adult. And then the, the wings um, will have a leathery forewing and a clear membranous hind wing. Or in the cases of walking sticks, they complete, uh, can be completely wingless. They have uh, mandibular mouth parts, so they cause a lot of chewing damage. The antenna can be um, it's straight, but it can be long, such as in katydids, or short such as in grasshopper. That's one quick way to tell to differentiate grasshoppers and katydids is by the length of the antenna. Uh, the eggs are laid in branches, sometimes in an egg case or uthika, so that's in the case of praying mantids. These are katydid eggs, so they lay them in a shingle type arrangement. Some of you have seen that. And these are grasshoppers. The grasshoppers will lay the eggs in the ground and they emerge and um, start doing their damage. And as you know, they can build up to very high populations in certain situations. But if you see this just gross feeding going on, often this will be grasshoppers. And they feed on a wide variety of hosts, a lot of weed hosts, but you see what they can do with citrus, corn, and uh, well, they'll be on all sorts of different crops. Locust or grasshoppers. And uh, we used to have um, some major locust migrations in, um, in the Midwest and in the Great Basin back in the 1800s. And we don't haven't really seen as much of that anymore, but there were some horrendous um, locust migrations and plagues basically in the Western United States 
over 100 years ago. But that is not quite as important now as, as you see now over in Africa and also in Australia. There's still some tremendous periodic buildup of these things. And um, it can be quite devastating to the local economies, especially in Africa. And there used to be a funding program to continue area-wide spray programs, but the only thing they could really do to try to knock these guys down, but um, th those poor countries couldn't afford it. So they uh, seized funding it. And so uh, US and some European countries stepped in back in 2010 and committed some, some, uh, some funds to help monitor it and pay for planes. And a lot of these things, had they had to have planes just sitting there not doing anything until these uh, infestations built up. Uh, and so that's worked and they're not worked because they got the equipment. And then when the, uh, the various population cycles cycled down to where there weren't very many grasshoppers or locusts out there, the, uh, the planes and, and the equipment fell in disrepair and they didn't have the equipment. So it, it got bad again. So right now they're fighting another uh, major problem over in the Sub-Sahara area in North Africa. But on our side here, we don't obviously thank goodness don't have to deal with populations that devastating. Um, so for us, chemical control and cultural control are, are probably the, the best way to go. There are natural enemies out there. I, I mentioned blister beetles that parasitize bees. They also parasitize grasshoppers. And sometimes when you do get a lot of grasshoppers uh, showing up in an area, the next season, often you'll see blister beetles show up as well because they were building up their numbers on the grasshopper numbers. So um, cultural control, you can try physical barriers, exclude them if you can. Um, also, if you can have a border to attract the hoppers outside your crop area, uh, that'd be good. But if you're gonna attract them there, then you, once you see them there, you've got to spray them out because once they're done feeding, they'll, they'll move out and attack whatever next crop is, is uh, available for them. Uh, there are baits um, out there containing uh, carboreal and pyrethroids. There is a, a um, organic bait with this Nosema locusti, which is a, I, I think it's a fungi, I'm not sure if it's a bacteria, but it's a, it's a natural occurring thing. And it's it's uh, formulated as a bait called Nolo bait. And my knowledge is it's not that effective. Or does anybody recognize this? If you said a praying man at egg sac, you're correct. So this is an Otheca. So praying mantis, they live about one year. Uh, some people like to keep them as pets. Um, they can be beneficial predators, but they can kill actually young hummingbirds. They've been known to kill hummingbirds on occasion and maybe other birds as well. You know, there's this the story that that uh, the female will decapitate the male before mating, and, and that does occur, but not all the time, but it does occur. All right, we're going to move over to cockroaches now. It's in this super family called Blatodia. And uh, this, believe it or not, there's over 4,000 species of cockroaches, most of them tropical. There's only very few that are actually uh, pests um, for um, urban pests for us. The main one being German cockroach, but there's uh, also the American cockroach as well, or yellow cockroach. So it's also uh, a hemimetabolous insect with an egg, a nymph, and an adult. Uh, the fore wings are thickened, the hind wings are clear, <clears throat> has mandibular mouth parts, allows them to chew and consume a wide variety of, of hosts. Straight antennae, and um, the eggs are in an egg case, just like praying mantids. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so once again, the main pest species, that's the interior infesting thing that we don't see that much here, but, um, but it's more common in the cities is the German cockroach. 
and the management of sanitation and gel baits. I'll get into that in a little more detail. So once again, we talked about the, the Uthika, the, the egg case. And that's one of the characteristics that unite cockroaches and praying mantids. So they go back a ways. But in addition to this egg case, there's also a weird other structural things that they share in common. And I won't get into it in too much detail, but they both have these little plates at the underside at the base of the uh, tail end of their abdomen, which is similar to both. Uh, inside their di digestive tract, they have these little tooth-like structures, which is called, um, this, is, this area of its uh, digestive tract is called the proventriculus, which is basically part of its stomach. And they've got, they both share these tooth-like structures in there too. So they are related to the super order called the Dictyoptera. You wouldn't think they would be. So it's all different looking. So back to the cockroach, these guys are quite old. There were fossils going back 350 million years ago. Um, they became very prominent in the Triassic 220 million years ago. And so they're, they're pretty tough. So they've survived you know, several extinction, extinction events uh, through the years. So how have they survived 220 to 300 million years? Well, they're extremely adaptable. This is some, some uh, slides I got from Don Gouge, uh, who's an extension at University of Arizona. And um, these guys, these American cockroaches have this gigantic genome. It's, it's uh, comparable to that of humans, 3.3 billion base pairs, which is huge. And so that gives them a lot of proteins, a lot of tools to adapt and survive. Out of these, these different genes, there's over a thousand that will code for chemical receptors, a thousand. So they, that gives them a, a adaptation to detect and, um, and consume a lot of different plant and host materials. So they've got over 154 olfactory or smelling receptors. 544 gustatory or taste receptors, and they're all located on these palps. And they probably even have some on their, on their feet. A lot of insects have it on their feet. So from all this wide variety, you know, they eat all sorts of stuff, protein, sugar, feces, keratin, cellulose. You know, most, most insects don't have that wide variety of a diet. Yeah, so these guys are important in many ways. They're, they're repulsive, obviously. They contaminate our food. They can mechanically, mechanically transmit several different pathogens, including viruses, fungi, protozoan, bacteria. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they can also trigger asthma um, in, uh, in different people, especially where there's lack of sanitation and, and areas of, uh, of a challenging economic areas, <clears throat> like in the inner cities, there's a much higher incidence of of asthma. <clears throat> um, and, and I guess I'll cover it in a bit, but there's been some very successful uh, city programs to, to uh, control these roaches using gel bays. And it's, it's been very successful in some of the inner cities back east. So one that we have is more common in the Prescott area is the American cockroach. Uh, this thing is native to Africa in the Middle East and uh, came out, it's believed to have come out here in the 1500s to the New World. So it lives outdoors and indoors, but more commonly, I think here you'll find them outdoors. Um, and, and they'll be under uh, rocks and wood piles and stone. Uh, I've seen them here at the house under cement slabs. <clears throat> and then they will come in. Um, if it gets too wet outside, they, you know, sometimes you'll find them coming in. So uh, they're living in trash, they like excrement, and then they move from excrement and trash to human food. So you can see the potential for a lot of disease transmission there. So for management, the best thing is to address the source, you know, remove wood piles, remove, you can't necessarily remove stones, but if you've got trash and, and debris, it's a very good idea to, to remove that as best you can. Um, and then monitor as best you can. There are traps out there where you can monitor them. And then if you do find them, there are some really good materials that can be applied that are safe that um, 
can be put in remote areas, um, uh, behind refrigerator, under sinks, behind stove, things like this, where the, the roaches will frequent and they can pick up the gel baits or the granular baits. And, um, and often the gel baits, they can also transmit the, uh, the toxicant from um, themselves to other ones through their excrement or through regurgitation. They vomit or they, they have feces out there. Other roaches will come in and they will eat the material as well. And there's enough toxicant in these baits that goes through the roaches that consume the baits that there's still enough in the excrement, excrement or in the regurgitant that it will kill, subsequently kill uh, other roaches as well. So it's very, it's very good that way. And this has been used in apartment complexes and also in, in uh, restaurants, for instance, in malls where you've got shared walls and uh, some, you know, some apartment areas are people may not be treating. So what they try to do is treat the whole apartment complex. Or if you got restaurants and malls, you treat, you know, all the restaurants and malls. Sometimes that's not possible, right? You have different owners and, and are different residents and they don't want to do it. But having these gel baits, you can have roaches coming from an adjacent restaurant and, um, and feeding and then going back and, um, and they can spread it to the adjacent restaurants. So it gives you more of an area-wide um, kill, which is pretty interesting. And so that basically relates to the, the German cockroach that I was talking to. You put a lot of these baits behind the, the appliances and all, and um, you can get some very, very good control. Yeah, here's a recipe for disaster. Um, here is some powder that, uh, or dust rather, that, that some uh, pest control people can use that is quite effective. And, uh, and then here's a, the gel bait that can be used. And these gel baits are very attractive. All right, we're gonna move on to termites, but you know what? I think let's take a break now for about what, 10 minutes or so? And uh, we'll come back. That yeah. be all right? Phil, yeah, let's go with 15. Because okay. uh, three and a half hours I've learned is a long haul. How's that look, back, back to normal? Looks good, Phil. Okay. All righty. Well, we're going to turn our attention to termites. And um, we've got a couple species up here. But overall, there's over 3,000 species worldwide. Uh, these guys also have three stages, an egg and a nipple stage and a, um, an adult stage. But um, there's also a soldier stage that is... Um, considered, I think, a nymphal stage as well. Um, wings, there's four wings. They're equal size and clear. And we'll look at the difference between termites and ants in a little bit, but you'll see that's different than, than ants. Uh, mouth parts are mandibular again. It allows them to chew in the wood or drywall, or in case of some of the tropical guys, they can actually um, chew in the sheet metal, believe it or not. Um, the antenna is straight and it's got the little kind of maniliform uh, segments to it. And they have a social cast it's with a queen and a division of labor. Okay, I mentioned the wings that are, there are four wings of equal size and they're clear. Uh, ants have a much larger fore wing than hind wing. They also have more prominent veins on the wings and termites do not. Termites, for the most part, have just a fine uh, couple veins, a costal, and they call it a subcostal vein running on the margin. That's another difference. Um, the antenna straight. Ants, ants have a bent antenna. The abdomen is not constricted in a termite and it is constricted in the ants. So those are the main differences that you can tell between the two. So we have workers and this is part of that cast um, uh, separation here. We have workers and we have soldiers. Workers are more involved in building tunnels and securing nutrients for the nest. 
soldiers are more involved in protecting the nest against invaders. And depending on the species, you have different ratios of soldiers to workers, anywhere from, from um, 20 to one, 20 workers to one, to maybe a hundred to one. And um, also the colony size can vary from over a million in a colony for some of these subtropical things like a Formosan termite, which is very common now established in Florida and South Texas and had a, a small, a small area in San Diego uh, had some uh, Formosan termites, over a million, and they're very aggressive. To, um, to as maybe like 100,000 or 80,000 of subterranean termites, to as little as less than uh, 50,000 or less than that, maybe even 20,000 with some of the desert subterranean termites. And when you're trying to control termites and you want to use baits, the smaller the colony, the harder it is to control because they're more localized. And so they don't interact. You may have you know, several colonies uh, of some species at, at a house and, and you put a bait out, they're not gonna be transferring the bait between colonies. So it's a lot tougher to control some species than others. All right, we talked about the difference between ants and termite adults. And here's the difference between ant and termite larvae or the workers. And on the left are ant, is an ant larva. On the right is a termite worker. And um, one of the obvious differences is that the termites have legs and, and the ant larvae do not. <clears throat> uh, the ants are more of a shiny pearlescent type uh, color to it while it's more cream and not quite as shiny. Um, very small head with the ants, very large, distinct head with um, the termites. Here's some evidence of um, some mud-filled tubes. This is out in the pine forest. And all this you'll see here is, is um, basically a mixture of, of mud and frass in these tubes. And this is subterraneans. There's two types of termites, basically subterraneans that have a ground contact and dry wood termites, which don't. And we'll get into that a little bit. Subterraneans maintaining that ground contact will build these tubes to allow them to bring up nutrients into the structure and um, maintain the uh, right humidity. And sometimes even they have some uh, temperature effects as well. Um, for these termites to go back and forth. But they maintain that soil contact for the most part to, to bring out moist mud and to basically uh, manage their environment inside these tubes. Um, that, that very aggressive Formosan termite I mentioned that has over a million uh, individuals in a colony, they're kind of the exception. They can, they can live in and areas that aren't connected to the ground. And I think for the most part, it's because they live in uh, more moist areas. San Diego is not normally a very moist, moist area, but uh, for whatever reason they survive there. Uh, in Florida and Texas in the tropics, you get so much rain, you get a lot of wet wood. Or you can have areas um, where you have air conditioners that are leaking and you get wet wood up in an attic and Formosan termites can get into there. But because our weather is pretty harsh, compared to the tropics up here and so dry, I suspect we're never gonna see Formosans in Arizona. They're kind of the worst case, but they're pretty interesting. But you do get some regular subterranean termites that uh, are not Formosans that can produce some tremendous tubes. And uh, this is, um, I believe this is out of, out of the Midwest. And this is all mud tubes coming through cracks in the foundation and going up and following a pillar up, up into um, the, uh, the house itself. So the way, if you have subterranean termites, the basic way of controlling these guys is to um, have a treated soil barrier around your structure. And um, if you've got uh, joints of different cement slabs, then you may have to have the folks maybe be drilling around those 
those expansion joints there for the, between the slabs as well, because if there's a joint, then the termites can come up between the joints. So that's how they do it. Uh, you got to go down eight to 12 inches deep and have this continuous barrier. Um, you can also inject wood with a non-repellent insecticide and the termites will enter and feed on the wood and pick up the insecticide. And the ones on the market take a while for the effect to take, a, for the Tosca to take effect so they can go back to the nest and transfer it to the colony and you can get an eventual uh, death as well. <clears throat> also, um, uh, if you see uh, infestations in wood out in the back or, or old fence material, um, that can serve as a source for uh, infestation in the house. So remove infested wood where you see it. That also goes for uh, driveways. If you've got infested eaves and stuff, it's good just to re replace some of that, that bad wood. So um, drywoods are the other termites. They don't have a connection to the ground. And so they don't have mud in their tubes. Uh, they don't form tubes. They just go directly into the wood and mine out the wood. And so instead of seeing this, this mud material stuck into the wood, you'll either see th these empty uh, excavations or you'll see little pellets. And often when you see infestations of dry woods, they'll be in window frames or in some uh, two by fours uh, in the garage, um, also in door frames. They tend to like that and they will mine into these, these uh, frames on the top side and you'll see piles, a little bit of piles of the pellets at the base of the window or at the base of the door. And they're basically raining down from the wood at the top of the, the window frame or the door frame. But that's what it looks like there. And here's a, a larger amount of material. So that's what this dry wood pellet material looks like. The main way of treating for these guys, as you probably know, is fumigation, but also there's a lot of surface treatment or uh, wood injection. Some people are, are doing, especially if the, if the termite infestation is very localized. But it takes a lot of good monitoring by the termite company to detect that. So um, that's the story with termites. Um, we're gonna move on to bees, wasps, and ants. There's 150,000 species at least of these guys. And they have an, an egg, larva, pupil, and adult stage. The wings are clear. Um, as we saw with the ants, the forewing is larger than the hind wing and there's a venation in the wings. The adults have mandibles, the larvae are, are quite variable. There are some, most larvae don't have much in the way of mouth parts, but there's some primitive uh, wasps called saw flies that, that do have uh, some mandibles and they can, um, they can eat leaves. Um, some of them even are involved in galls, which I'll show you a little bit later. The antenna are um, elbowed for ants, but for other ones, they can be straight or not, such as in, um, um, adult ants and a lot of adult wasps and bees. Females have an ovipositor. And as we saw with the ants and bees, there, there's a social caste system. So carpenter ants are pretty common up here. <clears throat> They're pretty good size ant. They're probably about half inch at least in size. Um, their diet includes nectar and honeydew, a lot of sweet foodstuffs, but they also will go after protein that would be found in maybe other insects or our um, grain debris, uh, things like that, especially when they're developing a brood or a nest and the larvae are developing, they will um, try to provision the developing larvae with uh, some kind of protein. They'll bore into the wood for shelter or nest. They really don't eat the wood. They just basically go in there to, to find a, to make a nest. For, their, uh, for the brood. So for management, you can use insecticide baits and those seem to work quite well. The, the sugar baits out there and then there's some baits that have some uh, protein in them and, and uh, depending on the time of year or the status of the colony, the uh, ants will go 
sometimes more towards the sugar, sometimes more towards the, uh, towards the protein bait. Uh, also wood treatment, especially like in, in, uh, in eaves and, and, and some attic areas where you can treat and, and that'll help prevent them. And a surface barrier treatment around the structure is also something they can do. Okay, here's some damage. You can see what they would do here. And here's some more damage. So they will produce more of a sawdust. Well, I'll say more of a sawdust. It's more of a, I don't know what you, what you call it. Um, I'll give it to it in a second, but it's not pellets anyway. It's more, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more, um, it's more like, um, Oh, I'll show you. I can't describe it. Yeah, <laughs> but it's different. It's more coarse. It almost looks like a mulch. Um, as I said they'll eat insects. Um, sometimes they'll even eat large ones. And often, sometimes they'll, they'll drag this stuff down or back into a to a nest and provision it, and then um, regurgitate back to the to the workers. Here's a worker here with eggs. And here's the wood debris that uh, the carpenter ants produce. So it's a lot larger than those pellets that termites produce and more copious as well. So there's the difference I was looking for between the termite pellets and uh, these like almost like wood shavings, I guess that you'll see from the carpenter ants. All right, carpenter bees are also a wood boring critter. There's a female and a male here. And uh, they love going into eaves. Here's one boring into there, ready to, getting ready to lay an egg in there. Here's some more boring that you'll see from carpenter bees. And you'll see, look at all this here. So, as I mentioned, if you can replace the infested wood, if it's localized, that's an excellent option. Another one is simply to plug the holes so the developing larva cannot emerge when it comes out as an adult and they're stuck there. Uh, you can also dust the holes with an insecticide, that will work. Uh, painted services seem to act as an impediment for entry in many cases. So keeping the wood up in good shape and keeping it freshly painted um, it can also help. And then you can also apply a residual insecticide. Pyrethroids are the best. They have the longest life. And those, those have also worked quite well. It's that, that long-term protection, uh, almost similar to using pyrethroids for a bark beetle protection or um, um, other pests that were attack trees. It's want to get that long-term protection. And basically it's, I think pyrethroids are probably the, the best ones. And we've got a lot of these guys around here. And you may have seen these um, in the eaves and on the ceilings and patios and, and, and entryways. Um, and it's a mud dauber called a mophila species. And these guys come out once a year. Sometimes when you have dry years, um, they won't come out until the following year. So there's a life cycle, maybe two years, but they'll make these nests um, and uh, have a lot of mud put together. They're, they'll lay eggs in there, then they'll go and they'll uh, find some prey and uh, bring them back, kill them, bring them back. And, uh, and then uh, that'll serve as food for the developing next generation. This is another one that's, that's pretty common here in Prescott, probably down in Camp Verde as well, which is the Western paper wasp. <clears throat> and um, uh, they can build up to some pretty high numbers and, and these, uh, these nests can get pretty large as well. So um, the best thing you can do if you can possibly remove the nest while it's still small, um, preferably at night when the wasp aren't as agitated, that's a good way to go. Um, also, you can treat these guys with a narrow stream of a foam product. The foam tends to, to calm them down like it does with bees for whatever reason. It, uh, that, the foam by itself may not necessarily kill it, 
unless you've got once again something in there, but it calms them down and, and then um, it kills them. There is some there's some coating with the soap that sometimes can suffocate them, but but it's it's not is is not as uh, efficacious as having a foam with some kind of a insecticide mixed in there with it. But that's um, those are the two methods. Basically, remove the nest or spray some kind of foam. Here's an example of, of how you can do this. And some of these things are on the market. You can spray the foam like so, and it can cover it up. Like the foam by itself, if you can get really really good coverage and just cover that the whole buddy nest, it can be pretty effective. Here's the Western yellow jacket. <clears throat> now it nests in the ground. There's an Eastern species back east that also nests in the ground. And of course, these guys love protein and love sugar and they can be very aggressive. And you see them a lot, as you know, at campgrounds, but uh, we get them here as well. Um, so if you can find the nest, which sometimes can be a, uh, uh, a, 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 a tough ch uh, chore in itself because these things sometimes will be under plants or in hard to access locations. If you can do that, you can treat them with the foam insecticide as well. And it will work quite well, but it's kind of tough to find them. Some of these nests can be pretty large. Here's the Eastern yellow jacket. Um, here's a ground nest that a guy was excavating. He brought out and you can see here's the actual hive itself is pretty large. So it can house quite a few yellow jackets in there. There's been this invasive one from Europe that's made its way over. And um, we've got it here. I'm not sure how common it is. I've seen it in California. It's, it's more common like in Texas and as you go back East, but we've got it here. And um, I don't know, Jeff, have you seen it in the in Prescott, Cantbury area? I've got one of those nests hanging in my office. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's here. And interestingly it's, enough, it was from a pine tree too. It, um, for some reason, it seems like they like it. I'll be. Yeah, so they're a little different. These are pretty effective. Some of these little yellow jacket traps, probably about the best thing you can do if you can't find them. You can't find the nest. Um, is try to keep um, keep your food covered. You don't want to have open containers that will attract the uh, uh, the yellow jackets. And this photo may be a little deceiving. It's better to put those yellow jacket traps a little further away from where you're um, <laughs> you're hanging out for the day because you're attract the yellow jackets to the trap. And if your picnic table is real close to that trap, they'll just come on over and bother you too. So uh, try to have this a little more remotely placed. And here's a new one. This is a real kind of exciting one for bug people. Um, it's called the Asian giant hornet. Some of you have probably have seen this now in the news. Uh, it's just this gigantic thing. It's, it's pretty aggressive. Um, it's got a, a very long stinger that I understand can actually puncture beekeeper suits, a traditional beekeeper suit. So it's, a, it's kind of a nasty one. So researchers now are wearing heavier neoprene suits, which I'm sure is not very comfortable. Um, so this is just something to keep an eye out on. I don't think it's too far south of Washington State yet, to my knowledge, but um, uh, it's it's uh, got the potential to move quite readily. And um, these things can attack um, beehives and can be quite destructive to beehives. You see it, they're gigantic. All right, we're gonna move on to another order. And uh, these are called thrips. These are very small. They're, they look like, uh, like if you take your, your pencil and just make a little tiny dash, they're about that size, probably, you know, three or four millimeters, very small. Um, <clears throat> the Sisonopter meaning fringe wing because of the fringe you see on the fore wing and on the hind wings. There's over 5,500 species worldwide. And uh, this is the one that I mentioned back at the introduction that we talked about the different types of metamorphosis. You know, I said there were three basic ones, right? The, there was just no metamorphosis at all. Uh, and then we had the uh, incomplete metamorphosis, egg, uh, nymph, and adult, and then the complete or holometabolous metamorphosis, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And this thing is 
kind of a once again, it's a weird hybrid between between the um, the incomplete and the complete because it has stages that look like it's incomplete, but yet they're quiescent, which is kind of like a complete. So once again, it's called neometabolus for the sticklers. Um, it has one mandible for puncturing. It's a modified mandible for puncturing. And um, also it has modified organs for siphoning plant fluids. The antenna is straight and it vectors several diseases, including a tomato spot, spotted wilt, which I don't believe we have here, uh, but we could in the future. Here's a, a microscopic shot of its modified mouth part, and that is its mandible. And you can see there, it doesn't have a counterpart. And so that's become a, basically a piercing um, and a, with the labrum, a sucking apparatus modified. And here they are, you can see they're quite small. And these are the nymphs. You see they don't have any wings on them. Um, and then here's what the adult looks like. I'm not sure if this would be one of those quiescent stages or not. Bill, what you described about thrips <clears throat> might uh, actually make some sense to me as to how difficult they are to manage at various times and how they uh, go from season to season because their numbers tend to get huge uh, in May. And then when we hit 95, 100 degrees, they disappear. Uh, and I, I'm imagining they spend a significant amount of their life cycle in the soil but um, this, this is a pest that vexes a lot of uh, fruit tree growers in particular. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure where they go. You know, it's, um, you'll find a lot of these species in flowers in the springtime as well. And some of them, uh, there, there's one species, uh, what's it called, Occidentalis, the common, common, I, I don't know the common name, but now Western Oxid flower thrift. Western flower, thank you. Yeah, Western flower. And that has a wide range of host plants and they really like going to flower. So when we have a, a good rainy winter and we have a spring bloom, uh, you can find these guys all over the place. And and then as those flowers dry, dry up, they can move you know, into uh, some of the other plants and cause some damage. Um, but for that, like the pear thrips, I think it's what you're maybe referring to is on the fruit trees. And then there's onion thrips and there's also some uh, thrips that get on grapes as well. Pretty specific. And I'm not sure exactly uh, where they will be spending their off times. If, if it's on other hosts or if it's in the soil, as, as you suggest, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank Um, and here's an example of, of some of that. Um, this is the grape thrips causing this, this uh, scarring and curling and, and deformation on grapes. Can also cause um, stunting, and and this is bad for grape growers because you you want to get good shoot growth so it'll support grape clusters later on. And um, either cold springs or thrips infestations can cause the nodes on grapes to be very, very narrow. And so in, instead of having an internodal length of you know, an inch or two, it might be a half inch, um, which is real tough. And that, that can happen in the spring. But often you also will see this, this wrinkling and crinkling of, of the leaves caused by thrips. Um, and onions, as I mentioned onions, it can be really tough on onions as well. It can cause a lot of stunting and, um, and uh, kind of a semi-wilt as well. On, on onions. On pears, you get a lot of scarring from thrips. And um, citrus, you can same thing. This is this is very classical thrips damage where they they hide under the calyx as the young fruit is developing. And they just basically feed around the calyx. And then as the fruit grows and matures and, and, and uh, develops, then that scarring material appears to grow as well. And it looks a lot larger. Um, you also get the scarring and curling of leaves here as well in citrus. But you see this in a lot of different plants. 
So that's um, that's the damage of thrips. There are some thrips are, are an interesting group. There are some natural enemies out there. Um, don't know how well they use, uh, how well they work. This, this Western flyer thrips is quite interesting because it not only is a pest, but it's also a predator. And Western flyer thrips can be actually very effective in um, going after spider mites. So it can actually be a ben beneficial in certain situations. Um, so kind of depends what kind of situation you're in. Um, as I mentioned, they, especially Western flower can develop on other plants as well. I don't know once again about pear thrips, but generally um, controlling weeds is never a bad idea. Um, and then you can try using a high pressure hose to, to uh, remove them from the leaves. If they're in protected areas like flowers or under the calyx like in citrus, then that high pressure hose is not gonna work very well at all. Um, removing old flowers, if you can. Um, exclusion, once again, that, that common theme comes back. Uh, if you can try to keep, keep the, uh, your plants protected, that'd be good. Reflective mulches have had uh, some various success, and I say variable success probably, um, but people have tried that as well. And uh, I, I don't know, I know Jeff at his place has, I think you've tried, you tried row covers over there, right? Is that basically for temperature? Have you ever had any pest exclusion results uh, or benefits? I, I don't use them on thrips, but we're getting lots of questions. And yes, that I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the Western flower thrips that goes to most of our fruit trees, except oh, okay. the stone fruit, stone fruit trees. And then the pear thrips, if you ever want to look for thrips, just go to a pear tree in, in that right season of the year, and you'll usually see scads of them. And then it was mentioned that there's an apple thrips, but I'm not sure that the apple thrips isn't either the Western flower thrips or the pear thrips moving off target. Because as you mentioned, the Western flower thrips has lots of hosts. Yeah, yeah. Well, if somebody could bring that in when we're able to, to interact with each other, I'd love to identify it, see what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so then when you go back to chemical control and there's a lot of materials out there that, uh, that can be used. But, but I will say uh, Western flower as, as uh, at least in agriculture that I've been in commercial agriculture, there's a lot of resistance out there. I'm not sure if we have it here because we, we don't have the intensive pesticide use here, right? But it is one of these pests where um, resistance has shown up and has been um, a little bit tougher to control with some of these things. And I wouldn't be surprised if um, some of the systemics may not be quite as effective as, as they used to be. Right, and um, the only other thing I'd add, Phil, is, um, you know, if you've got a good fruit crop and it's on, uh, say, a stone fruit tree or an apple tree, usually the fruit will survive. You might see some scarring on it, especially on things like nectarines. But um, usually the damage is to the foliage in the springtime uh, on, the, on the fruit tree issues. And then, like I said, once the temperatures go up, you can't find them on the plant really easily anymore. So I, they, they either go, they go somewhere else. And yeah. uh, I'm just not sure. And it's such a small little thing, you know, uh, it just hasn't been researched extensively here on stone fruits. I'm sure the information's out there somewhere. And then there was a question about the reflective mulch. Um, some of those, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting book I have in my office on different colored mulches uh, used for agricultural applications. And with the, with the thrips, I can't remember what color it is but when I go through San Diego San Diego County those tomato fields that are on the hills they have yellow sticky film and they have blue sticky film mm. I think the blue is for the thrips but I'm not absolutely sure so yeah me neither I don't yeah, know so there, there's knowledge out there we have to chase it down because thrips is a it's a significant pest of fruit trees around here for sure yeah, um, along that line, though, I, I, for trees, I wouldn't think the mulch would, would be as effective as it would for vegetables because 
you've got so much foliage on the trees covering it up. You know, I, I've never heard of reflective mulches in, in trees. Have you? No, I, it's no, a vegetable it's, thing. It's mostly vegetable crops. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I hadn't heard that. I'll have to look into that too. I uh, was unaware of the blue reflective mulch. It, was, right. it wasn't reflective mulch. It was actually like a sticky trap that surrounds the field that's a, uh, a sheet of water. Oh. It's about two feet wide uh, and it goes around the entire field. And oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So it's just a trap, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's good, thanks. All righty, moving along, we're gonna talk about a arthropod, but it's a not an, not an insect, it's a mite, so it's, it's an arachnid type thing, has eight legs, so it's related to the spiders and the scorpions, but can cause quite a bit of damage in many species of agricultural plants as well. You'll see a lot of stippling, um, such as what you see here and here, this kind of yellow pattern, yellow green pattern uh, uh, confirmation there. Um, Sometimes this can look like leafhopper damage as well. But if you see the webbing, that's pretty indicative of, of um, spider mites. There are a couple mites, citrus, the citrus red mite and a European red mite. And I don't think we have citrus red mite in the area, or at least in citrus down below. I'm not sure about European red mite. Has anybody reported European red mite on you pears know, or apples? I, I no. have not identified it. So I. Okay. Couldn't really say, but we've I've seen some with reddish on them, but quite honestly, Phil, most of the time we see the damage on junipers uh, uh, with uh, with spider mites, and it's usually along a dusty road or something. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'm just gonna say that several species of mites uh, don't have the webbing. And so you have to look a little more closely and look at that, the type of damage that you're looking at, the bronzing or stippling, in some cases it gets bad defoliation. Um, but yeah, okay, that's good to know. So management, um, there are natural enemies out there. Um, there are some companies that actually raise natural enemies and their predatory mites, whether they would, would work out here is another story. They're, they're pretty expensive and they are more used in high intensive crops like strawberries. Um, they, they do have a, a good role in keeping down some of the more damaging mites on strawberries, but uh, I don't think that would come into play here. Um, and as Jeff mentioned with the junipers that they're associated with junipers growing along dusty roads and that is a a big thing with probably most mites. They, they tend to build up in the dusty areas. And I'm not sure if that's, um, I, I think it's, it's probably just makes the mites a little tougher to get access to with the natural enemies because there's a lot of, a lot of cases where natural enemies will tend to keep these populations in check. And the reason we know that is that when we have sprayed particular insecticides that we know kill off the natural enemies, then you'll get this, this secondary infestation of mites. It's a pretty common thing that happens. Uh, and that's because the natural enemies have been decimated. And so that may be very similar in that respect too, that the natural enemies just can't get into or don't want to get to that dusty substrate. So that's a big thing. Try to uh, Avoid the dust buildup. If you have to, just try to use a hose and and, um, and uh, rinse off those trees. Um, so I, you can try using soaps and oils. And in some cases, uh, there are some caricides out there. I just don't know how bad um, these infestations can can get. And if it's after the fact, when when you're seeing this this dieback, I say that the major thing is just to try to avoid, uh, avoid the dust buildup. All right, um, just a little bit on, um, on galls. Uh, we're all pretty much all familiar with uh, oak galls, which we have on the right here. 
and caused by the sinipid oak gall wasp. And there are a whole bunch of species of these things, hundreds of species of oak wasps. But um, there's other gall forming insects I'd mentioned earlier about, about wasp and, and uh, we talked about um, uh, saw flies and you know, some larvae of wasp. Basically, most of them don't have legs. Well, saw flies do have legs. Um, they almost look like a, a moth larva, but some other saw flies will lay their eggs into leaf tissues and, and willows, a real common one, and you get these galls formed by the developing larvae inside. And that's caused by a, a wasp. It's called a saw fly, but it's really a wasp. There's also mites, some aerial phylum mites. There's a whole subgroup of mites that cause not just the stippling that I was telling you about, but they can cause galling and they can call witch brooming. Witch brooming is when you have this strange whirl of growth coming off branches and it's not a normal shoot. It's condensed and, and stunted. And uh, once again, it's like a whirl and that can be caused by mites as well. And then there's other groups um, that are similar to these gall mites that cause very strange deformations in fruit as well. So these mites can be quite variable. But um, um, we will see some that have these, these uh, red galls here. Also, there's some flies. Remember, we talked about mosquitoes and midges. And midges don't have uh, uh, the big stylet mouth part, but they, otherwise they look pretty much like mosquitoes. Well, there's a group of these midge type flies that will also cause galling. And here's one that's pretty common in the area that gets on a silk tassel. And that's caused by a, by a midge. And uh, we also have um, hackberry galls. I've seen these over on the east side of the, the Black Hills, just above, uh, above Camp Verde and above Cottonwood. Um, I've seen these galls on hackberry, and these are caused by a psyllid. We haven't talked about psyllids, but psyllids basically look like cicadas, but only psyllids are only about a half inch long, like very miniature, minute cicada type critters as adults. As, as uh, immatures, they look like uh, almost like a white fly. Uh, but then you've got some that develop inside the petioles of hackberry leaves and form these galls. So that's one. And then lastly, we have um, aphid caused galls. And these you'll see um, over, at, you can see them at the Highland Center and the Bradshaws and Santa Prieta, all through the mountains in the southern part of, um, of Prescott. Uh, in the Manzanita there, you'll see these guys. So those are, once again, caused by aphids. All right, so um, we're gonna move on to Another group, these are all predatory insects. They're in the order Neuroptera, which means nerve wing. And uh, I think it's kind of referring to the, the fine uh, ramifications of the veins here that almost look like a neural pattern, I suppose. But um, these are the lace wings and antlions. Over 6,000 species known throughout the world. And they're one of the other groups of, of uh, holometabolists or complete metamorphosis insects with an egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Um, the wings are equal sized, kind of like termites in that regard, they're equal sized, but they're a little different. The, the venation journey is a little stronger than the forewing. Um, they will hold, when they're at rest, the wings over the body in sort of a uh, roof like triangular conformation, mandibular mouth parts, because they are predatory, straight antenna, short, and antlions a lot longer in lace wings. And once again, they're, they're predatory. This is the, um, the immature stage, the, the larval stage of, um, of a lace wing. And these are the eggs laid on stalks. And they do this because these guys are so predatory, they're also cannibalistic. So uh, the first one that hatches, sometimes will go in and wait for the next ones to hatch and um, we'll start consuming them. But um, allegedly laying these things on the stock 
provides some degree of protection, I say some, of, from the other cannibalistic larvae that are hatching. So these, uh, once again, they're, they're, they're very good predatory animals. You find them in, in a lot of crops, very common in crops. Um, normally under natural situations, they don't build up into numbers that really have much of an effect, but some companies now are rearing these things in mass. And one of the local ones is Arbico, which is out of Tucson that produces these things. <clears throat> and um, uh, how well they, they work, uh, I don't know, um, but they are selling them and people are buying them. Um, and if the pest population is just starting out and not too high, then these things will have a better chance of, of working. But it's like uh, some of the folks that were selling ladybird beetles. If you don't have enough to keep them busy, they're gonna, they're gonna go, they're gonna fly away. A lot of times ladybird beetles will fly away anyway, but, but if you have uh, an adequate and appropriate amount of prey and food source for them, i.e. the pests that you're trying to control, then they'll stick around for a bit and they could, they could have some effect. Arbico sells a lot of these guys, so there's a pretty good market for them. So those are lace wings. And then the other group are the ant lions. These guys are really interesting. Um, if you find more of these in, in sandy areas, deserts, dunes. Um, we have them here quite a bit too. Uh, and, and this is the great looking larvae. Look at those mandibles. And um, some of these guys are, are also eat pollen and nectar, curiously enough, as well as other insects. They're not that common. And you, but because their larval habitat is in soil, they're, they're not important in agriculture at all. I guess some people may get these guys confused, but they're pretty different. This is the damselfly versus an ant lion. And you see the damselfly has got a lot more color to it and the wings are held parallel to the side while the ant lion is generally this, this brown patterned wing and they're folded once again, roof-like over the body. And maybe you've seen these little cones in the soil around town, out, out in the parks around here. Um, this is built by that immature stage of the antlion. And um, they just wait for some unassuming insect to come wandering back, like this little ant here. And you'll see there he is right there coming out. And um, he's going to grab him and take him down and eat him. So they're pretty interesting. So those are antlions. Another group is called uh, the Domaptera or earwigs. And um, curiously, there's almost 2,000 species of these guys. And I had no idea there are that many because in the US, there aren't that many at all. I, I've been in Panama actually, and I saw <clears throat> more than I could ever imagine. And down there, they're metallic blue, metallic green, and they're big and they're um, just, am just amazing down there. Uh, so these guys have the three stages the wings or um, basically have a, a pigmented forewing and a very short, <coughs> excuse me, both wings are very short, but the hind wings are clear. Mandibles for mouth parts and these cerci that are um, pretty hooked. And um, not really sure what the function is of those guys. They rear them up like this when, when perturbed but they don't possess any toxins and, and uh, I don't know if they really, what, what they do, to be honest with you, but because um, I'm not aware of them like killing or attacking any, any uh, predator because of it. Um, they are general predators, but they will eat plant material as well. They're a very strange group. I mentioned the tropical ones. There's ones that live in caves. There's ones that live uh, with bats. They're just a real crazy bunch. But for the most part here, they're under bark and trees or under rocks, mostly nocturnal. We see them during the day occasionally, but they're more nocturnal and, and predatory once again, but they will attack plants as well. And um, here you'll see that they, I don't know if this plant is, but one way you can deal with these guys is um, you can put out a trap in the ground and then put some kind of oil, you can say you can put 
vegetable oil in there, for instance, and they can wander in there and get stuck. It's almost like the pitfall trap I was talking about earlier, and that can work. If they are causing a lot of problems, and I frankly haven't seen earwigs, uh, maybe once I've seen them in pretty good numbers, uh, then you can use, use chemical controls. But I, generally, they're not that big of a problem. Phil, last summer was the first time I had actually uh, gotten reports of it, and I didn't believe it. And then we looked at it, and sure enough, they were eating mostly young plants like you see in the picture here. So uh, I, you know, you just have to be around long enough to see it. And uh, it seemed to be a very isolated incident. And, you know, they, they like organic matter and so on. So I, they can be managed, I think, fairly easily. But it's kind of frustrating when you're not expecting them to do anything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Because I've seen them. I've seen them commonly under bark um, and with, you know, there's all sorts of other insects under bark. And I, I'm thinking they're just sitting there eating other insects there, but um, yeah, I guess they just eat a little bit of everything. All right. <clears throat> other important arthropods. Um, I'm, I'm going to cover some of the aquatic guys briefly in just a little bit. I didn't know how much time we would have today for the, for the talk, but um, I did want to divert just a wee bit to talk about some other important arthropods that aren't insects um, that you may get questions about or hear about. Um, ticks is, is a big one, and um, they vector Rocky Mountain spotted fever out here. They vector Lyme disease in the Midwest and the East. It can be pretty, pretty tough. Um, so those guys you got to look out for. There's been uh, some programs that I don't think I've got time to go into it today up on the, uh, the Navajo land up north where they had a lot of uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and they had a, a really integrated program, a real nice program where they, they got rid of a lot of debris where, these, where the ticks would hang out. They used uh, tick collars for the dogs that were harboring these ticks and um, also sprayed some of uh, areas around fences or areas that were um, kind of neglected where these things were also building up. And um, they reduced the incidence of Rocky Mountain spotted fever tremendously up there. So it was a real, real interesting uh, program that was conducted up there. But uh, so those are ticks, which of course are very important. Uh, scorpions, as we know, um, are, are important. And, you know, but the, I think that one of the more important things and trying to prevent them is to try to exclude them, make sure that you got your, your house uh, protected, you've got cracks that are caulked and stripping that's down and any opening that's possible, you basically try to, uh, try to cover that up as best you can. <clears throat> but it's a lot of times that's tough. They can, they can go through the little openings in your windows um, and hang out there and come through under screen doors and every which way. And often you'll see them somehow getting in through the drywall and going up and then they'll come in and, and end up in your light fixtures in the ceiling. So they're all over the place. So you can exclude them by trying to, to get your house as, as protected as possible. But if worse comes to worse, then, um, then uh, uh, a pyrethroid powder is, is really good. Some people also use a silicon powder that is an abrasive that causes the uh, integument, the cuticle to break down and they dehydrate. That's that's not bad, uh, but it's not as effective as these pyrethroid dust that uh, a lot of pest control people will uh, liberate around the base of the house and the perimeter. That's, that's probably the most effective for scorpions. Um, what else? We've got spiders, we have black widows. We also have the desert recluse. This is the recluse spider here. Um, and um, they basically are, are, are like cockroaches. You know, they, they go to areas like cardboard boxes and areas that are, are um, basically untouched, even though I did have a friend that had one underneath his desk and he got bitten. So sometimes they, they come in, but they're generally, as the name implies, reclusive and they're not very aggressive. So um, not, not that um, commonly encountered. Uh, here, here's one, the camel spiders you guys have probably heard of. And, um, this is a Photoshop. It was quite quite popular back in the early uh, 2000s that, that word was going around that these gigantic things 
could uh, inject a, a uh, anesthetizing toxin on the leg while the GI slept. And, um, and then they would start gnawing away at people's legs, <laughs> which uh, was a slight exaggeration as well as the photo. These, the ones there basically are about four inches and uh, they're not aggressive. And uh, this is just um, a hoax. So what else? Um, Bill? Yeah. Uh, just, just real quickly, um, when I've gotten lots of reports about scorpions, they're usually in newer subdivisions. And you can put two and two together there where their habitat is being paved over and so on. <clears throat> but um, uh, if you burn wood for a wood stove, that's another way that they come in. That's how they get into my house. And if you see lots of them, just remember to wear slippers or shoes or something most of the time uh, with the, the scorpions. The Solpugids, um, we see lots of them here. And I'm sure you've seen lots of them, Phil. But um, typically uh, in the summertime, when we start seeing beetles and things coming into lights, they'll eventually drop to the ground and you'll find lots of Solpugids on the ground wa waiting for them. And those yeah. things are fast. And yeah. Excellent predators. People have a fear of them, but they're actually a very beneficial insect for us. Good so point. I just wanted to yeah. throw those, throw my two cents in. Yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, that, that's true. When I've been out with friends uh, with lights and, and looking at insects come in, um, not uncommonly, you'll, you'll see some of these uh, called camel spiders or sulpugids come in too, just looking for a feast. Yeah. Um, let's see. Don Goose put together this little map in the lower right. I'm not sure how long ago this was, rather recent, but um, you can you can see that that uh, the, the, the urban areas in the desert is is where they're obviously more common in in areas where, as Jeff said, that probably with a lot of new developments, causes these guys to come in. All right, um, so now I'm just going to touch upon some other more minor insect orders for about five or 10, and I think that'll probably do me. Okay, so here's a not very commonly encountered group, the silverfish and the jumping bristle tails. And there's uh, there are two different groups, 400 species of one, about 350 species of another. Um, these guys basically just have an egg and then um, uh, uh, a larval or a nymph adult stage that looks the same. So it's called ametabolus or um, just basically no, no metamorphosis at all. They don't have any wings. Uh, some of these are extremely primitive as they are as primitive and have been around as long as cockroaches have. Uh, they have mandibles, um, long thread-like antennae, three tails to them, uh, the silverfish, in this case, the body's flat, uh, bristle tails, uh, the body is more cylindrical and, uh, and they can jump quite a bit as well. They tend to come in when the, the weather is colder or wet, uh, they'll come in and you'll see them like uh, often in, in uh, the bathroom wandering around. Um, but they're, they're basically negligible, negligible as being a damaging pest whatsoever. That's just something that you see. Uh, and then we get into some of the aquatics with mayflies, uh, just briefly. Um, it's another group that I thought would include. So they're a uh, they're hemimetabolist, egg and, and a nymph and adult. The wings are clear, that they're folded upright over the body. The forewing is larger than the hind wing. Um, the adults don't really have mouth parts. The nymphs have mandibles because they're predatory. Uh, you'll see two or three tails on the aquatic nymphal stage. And they also have, uh, have gills on the outside of the admin, which are basically right here. You can hardly see it, but uh, those are little gills there. So they're, for anybody that's a fisherman, of course, you guys know these quite well. Another group is the stoneflies, uh, a whole bunch of species as well. Egg, nymph, and adult stage. Uh, the wings are clear and they lay flat over the body. So if you see them laying flat over the body like that, that's pretty distinctive of a stonefly. Um, here's the nymphal stage, it's two tails and has gills, but the gills are on the underside of the abdomen as well. And once again, these are also predatory. 
in water. And we have caddisflies, Trichoptera, 12,000 species worldwide. Once again, an egg, nipple stage, and adult stage. Um, the adults resemble moths, very, very similar. I mean, I taught some classes um, where we have a little lab. I'll bring in <clears throat> some adult caddisflies and have some very similar appearing uh, adult moths. And, um, and I'll have the, the students try to tell me which is which. And if you look under the microscope, caddisflies, as the name implies, trico meaning hair, hair wings, they have seedier hair on these wings, not scales. So if you look at the moth wing, you'll see very flat scales on those wings, while the caddisfly has no scales but hairs, but enough hairs that it, there's a, a pigmentation there that you see that uh, gives a very similar appearance. appearance. <clears throat> Aquatic, um, gills are on the abdomen, and interesting about caddisflies is that the nymphs will form these cases made out of pebbles or small sticks or debris. And um, they'll wander around with, with these things and um, very distinctive. So those are caddisflies. Then we have dragonflies and damselflies, it's Odinata, um, 4,000 species. Once again, an egg, a nymph and a dog. Um, wings, we've seen what the wings are. I think I'll show you those a little bit later. Mandibular mouth parts, and then they have gills as well, being an aquatic. Uh, dragonflies have them actually inside the rectum here. There's actually, believe it or not, a, a, a cockroach that has uh, not gills, but it has organs inside this rectum to absorb moisture. Um, so there's all sorts of weird, weird uh, adaptations that these guys undergo. But here it, it's got the gills inside. Um, well, it's uh, and, and damselflies, the gills are out by its tails. So all these aquatics have gills, but and they're all in different areas. So those are the aquatics. Um, now I'm going to talk about uh, book lice. These are sosives. And um, if you remember, I talked about the hackberry gall, but that's a sosive. This is what the actual adult looks like. Over 4,000 species. Um, not really, not really a pest to my knowledge, except they, they have been implicated with um, destroying books and old libraries. They come in and they go for the glue and then the paper. And uh, in some cases, in weird situations, there's been some of these you know, books having some destruction and it was caused by book lice, like, hence the name book lice, but not, not commonly encountered. And getting towards the end here, springtails, this is another real primitive group. They're about the size of some of those uh, silverfish and bristle tails. Um, this has a, a, what they call a, a fricula and a, and a furculum, and it's also used for, for jumping as well. Um, internal scraping mouth part. Um, they're basically non-damaging, but you will see them come inside occasionally if you have real wet weather in the winter, they may show up and they're wingless. Phil? Yeah. We get calls about these almost every year. And okay. typically what happens is they're coming up uh, when the soil gets extra moist, say around monsoon time, they're coming up through the cracks in a slab and just you know thousands of them and people freak out about it. Uh, <laughs> they're you know, as you said, basically harmless, but just the sheer numbers of them. So this this is something that we do encounter uh, mm -hmm. at the extension help desk quite often. It's not that it's a pest, it's just, it scares people. Yeah, yeah. But insects often do scare people. Um, and so anyway, continue on, sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. Yeah, no, I, I say, I, I've not seen them here since I've been here. And, I, and then the uh, monsoon season makes sense. Over in California, they came in the spring, which was at the end of the rainy season, winter, spring. And, but yeah, they were basically coming in after, after the rainy season or during the rainy season. That makes sense. All right, and fleas is another group, uh, almost 2,000 species. Um, they're the vector of the black plague. And um, they have four stages the uh, egg, larvae, pupa, and adult. 
course, they, they, they get on our pets. The larvae have uh, mandibular mouth parts, while the adults have uh, the piercing mouth parts, so they can suck blood, and they're wingless. There's also lice, which uh, attack people and attack birds. And uh, it's almost 5,000 species of these guys. They have an egg and a, a nipple in adult form, wingless. Um, in mammals, they're sucking mouth parts. In birds, uh, they have mandibles. And so they're mostly chewing mouth parts on birds. And uh, they've been involved with vectoring typhus fever which has an illustrious history through the ages, causing all sorts of problems. And that is it, folks. Well, Phil, thanks so much. Um, uh, I, I, I've been taking notes, and I, I think since we've got a little extra time here, of course, we don't have to go all the way. We, we usually go until 1230. Uh, and that, but it, it's great that we have time here. So um, let's let's uh, stop the sharing, yeah, and uh, make it so if everybody wants to kind of go to a gallery view, we can see most everybody. And um, first, I want to just thank you for uh, every every time you've done this for me. Uh, I think this is the maybe the third time now. Uh, but at least the second, every time you've updated your presentation and put in, put new information and like every entomologist I know, you're just watching things so closely and waiting for that new information to come to light. And um, what I hope everybody gets for one thing from this, this session is the diversity of insects that are out there and the, the sheer numbers of different species and the fact that we've only identified, it, it must be three less than three quarters of them anyway, right, Phil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably even less, yeah, probably even less probably than less that, than that. Enough, yeah. Yeah, because we don't know what we haven't identified yet, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, one of the really interesting things uh, about insects is how adaptable they are, how, um, how different, you know, even within the same types of families, like looking at bees, all the different ways that they make a living. And so I, I hope uh, everybody's got an appreciation of that. But really, the main uh, part that was important about today is when we start looking at pest management, we need to be able to identify the pest. And that's why it's so critical that we understand these, uh, the, the orders of the insects, how to identify them, what uh, some of the distinguishing features are. Because a lot of times as a master gardener volunteering at the help desk, you'll get something and you'll have no idea. And it, it takes some experience and some time but with some of the things that we talked about today, uh, it helps you get close to the order of it. And then once you start looking at the order, you can often drill down. But the other thing I want to mention is, you know, Phil's a local guy. And uh, if we really get stumped, I, I don't try to I try not to bother Phil too often. <laughs> but we can ask. And the University of Arizona has a wonderful um, insect collection, too. And uh, one of the things, if it didn't come through in today's talk, Arizona is one of the more di insect diverse places uh, in the United States anyways, um, just because of all the different environments that we have and ecosystems. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of generalizing, but I, I did make some notes about particular things. Um, one of those things, you notice that Phil emphasized the mouth parts. Well, when you're looking at plant damage, the difference between a piercing and sucking mouth part and a chewing mouth part is, is often obvious. Uh, certainly the chewing is obvious. And then the piercing and sucking part, you have to look pretty closely to see it. But if you can determine that, 
that clears the way for identification quite well because so many things have chewing mouth parts uh, and, and uh, don't have piercing and sucking ones and vice versa. Um, the other thing that is a big picture kind of thing is native versus introduced insects. And uh, I'm, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, Phil, most of what you talked today, about today, uh, other than the cockroaches and things, were, were native insects. But some of them have been introduced, and many of our pests are introduced. And last week, we spent some time talking about weeds and biological control of weeds. Well, if an insect comes and it's native, if an insect is imported and it's native predators that are, are part of its NACO, native ecosystem aren't imported with it, it finds new food sources and like this Formosan termite. Is that the one that eats metal, Phil? No, that's another one. Okay, because yeah. I've heard people say, oh, they eat concrete. I've, I've heard that and I have a hard time believing that too, but Maybe it was just really lousy concrete. <laughs> but um, uh, so, you know, when we're talking about things like bark beetles, these bark beetles that we're talking about here are a natural part of our ecosystem and they provide control of too, too dense of stands in and of themselves. And while it, it inconveniences humans because we end up liking these trees and not appreciating that the insects are actually doing a job that human beings can't get to, don't have the capacity to do for them. But it also has ramifications. You know, there's fuel buildups and things like that. Um, so, you know, native versus introduced with these insects. If it's introduced, uh, like we've got several that we're keeping an eye on, the emerald ash borer is, uh, I believe it's in Texas now and it's in Boulder, Colorado. But if it ever got to Yavapai County, our ash trees would be in big, big trouble. And it's not inconceivable that they could get here just by somebody hauling a piece of firewood, just something as simple as that. And then all the ash trees, if you want to keep them, are going to have to be treated with an insecticide. So um, in that regard, it's kind of scary. Uh, I have a lot of ash trees, and, and they're one of my favorites. So um, understanding uh, the, the dynamic when there's a native insect, it's really part of the ecosystem and it has some beneficial function, even if we haven't taught ourselves to appreciate it. Um, so uh, one of the more recent things that Phil uh, talked about were the stoneflies and caddisflies, caddisflies. And um, quite often, I'm sure some of you on the call have done activities with groups of people to assess stream health. And that's exactly what you do. You get down in the stream and you look for these things. And if you find them, that stream is healthy. Uh, and if you don't find them, um, chances are there's some factor that's impairing that stream, such as maybe oxygen availability or some non-native thing like a crayfish that's in there that is causing havoc. Um, so anyway, I found that interesting. Uh, I think you just added that in this year, Phil. And um, uh, I'm, I'm sure many people on this call today and part of the class uh, have done those activities. And it, it's, it's what biologists do to assess stream health. And they just inventory the invertebrates and. It's a really fun thing to do with young people because then they learn uh, not to fear insects. Um, because let's face it, many people are afraid of insects. And uh, in many cases, that fear is, is founded, you know, uh, that they can harm us. Uh, that tarantula hawk, I'm sure everybody's uh, seen flying around you don't want to get stung by that thing or that velvet ant that's out there, which is also a wasp, uh, that packs a punch too. Uh, that's like one of the more painful stings that's out there. And um, it's just almost impossible to talk about everything there is to know about insects in a three hour, three and a half hour course. So Phil, I'm going to stop talking, and if, if any of my comments resonated with you and, and uh, 
you'd like to share some further thoughts, I, I'd like, you know, I, I don't want to dominate the conversation here. No, I'm taking notes. That's good. I'll be making more changes for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, um, uh, you know, I just I would just say one thing along your native and, and introduced species. That's really that's really good. And and when you you know, I, I think of one of the more obvious ones. Uh, I can think of an, an agricultural example in a, a several urban agriculture. Uh, there's a a native. Uh, um, potato beetle called the Colorado potato beetle that was basically native to um, I think the Great Basin states and the Western Great Plains and as agriculture brought uh, potatoes out and um, basically I think potatoes I'm not sure about tomatoes but potatoes for sure this Colorado potato beetle switched over from its native host in the Rocky Mountain states to potatoes and then started working its way back and now it's like one of the major past all the way back to the East Coast. So it's one of these things where a native was yeah. an induced pest because we invaded its habitat. And I think about a lot of the structural pests, the, the subterranean termites and drywood termites and carpenter ants, we're invading their habitat. And, mm -hmm. and that's why we're having the problems. They, you know, they belong there and, and we're in areas where, where we, you know, frankly, if we're gonna be there, we're gonna have to deal with these things. So that's kind of along your line. Yeah, right. And they're recyclers, the termites are. Um, uh, I, I had a natural resource professional years ago that was just going after me like crazy, telling me that the termites were eating the live grass. And every entomologist that I talked to said, termites do not eat live vegetation. They eat dead vegetation and they recycle it. Uh, but, you know, people get <laughs> ideas in their head and they get stuck there and um, anyway, he finally retired, but he was waiting for <laughs> to pick that up and go with it because he was sure. And who knows, you know, if you look long enough, you might find a case. It's that rule in nature where 99% of the time you can talk in generalities, but that one or even a fraction of 1%, uh, it's going to be different because some organism has evolved a, a different strategy. And it's like the others, but it's figured out something different than, than they did. Well, um, another thing about species, since yeah, you know, it's got time to kill, and you know, we say, oh, what's described as only half the number of species out there. And, and it, it, it's, it gets even more complicated now because well, certainly the tropics harbor you know, the majority of diversity and, and everything practically, but the, the geneticists are now uh, adding their, their bit that's throwing another cog in the, in the wheel and that there are so many species geneticists are finding now that look identical. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a beautiful blue skipper and it, it comes up into Mexico, almost into uh, Southern Arizona, but extends down into Latin America. Well, some folks started watching the, the skippers and then they were starting to raise them and they found that these larvae didn't always look the same and they, over 20 years, they've looked at the host plants that these larvae were feeding on. And the larvae, looked, as I said, they looked a little bit different, but the adults all looked exactly the same. Everything, reproductive structures, everything. And for years and decades and decades was considered one species. And now after they went and reared these things on different host plants, they found out that the particular larva, they had a particular coloration, it stayed on that particular species of host plant. And then they finally followed up with the genetic uh, sequencing now. This just came out recently, you know, five, six years ago. And they found 12 distinct genetic sequences that completely aligned with 12 complete different host plants for the same bloody blue skipper that lives in the same area, 12 of them. So it went from one species to 12 species now, you know, and they all look alike. If you're looking at the adults, you, you know, you would never know. So. That's, you know, that kind of work is, is happening now over and over again. And so that's why we say, yeah, we got 20,000 described and it could be, you know, another 20,000. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's always amazing. Uh, human beings like to think that, you know, they're the ultimate great thing on the, you know, in the world. But and that we understand everything. But when you start looking at entomology and many other things, you just learn that 
uh, we're not as smart as we think we are, and there's still a lot to learn. Um, there, there was a, I'm gonna go to the, there's lots of stuff coming up in the chat box, so I, I don't wanna ignore that. Um, so uh, leaf miners, mm. um, I, I see them on four o'clocks at my house. Uh, I don't really see them, uh, and that's a native plant. I don't see them in my garden really uh, as a pest, uh, but uh, anything, any knowledge you can uh, share with us about leaf miners, Phil? I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, they're tough, they're, they're tough. Yeah. I, I, they, they just are, I, and unfortunately, I think you probably just have to live with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there, you know, some leaf miners are moth larvae and some leaf miners are fly larvae. So there's two different groups and they have different biologies, different host plants and all But um, For whatever reason, you know, there's, there is, it's not as if you can like, you know, maintain good irrigation and keep a good vigorous plant. That doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, insecticides it's, are very tough. Some of them are protected inside the leaf mines and it's hard to get uh, systemic materials in there and the systemics that are, are available, a lot of them don't work on leaf miners. Um, so. Yeah, they're, they're kind of a tough group. And, and what I've found is that, is that when, you, when you see leaf miners that, that don't necessarily progress as well, there's a lot of natural enemies that take care of them. So certain cases, leaf miners can be an upset pest after a spraying. They can destroy natural enemies like spider mites and you get an outbreak. So that may be something to watch. Yeah, yeah, there's just uh, so much to know. I'm, um... Let's see, uh, the compliments on your book. I'm, I'm uh, gonna be getting my copy fairly soon too. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, don't you know, buy it. Oh, by the way, don't buy it. Uh, you got one coming. Oh, well, thanks, Phil. Thanks. Because so he much. helped me out, you guys. He actually reviewed a lot of it. That's the least <laughs> I can do. So I appreciate well, that. I appreciate that. But what, what <laughs> I was gonna share with everybody is really, you know, your work has connected um the the butterflies and the the larvae that develop into those butterflies to a host plant and a range and you know done some of that really kind of uh basic research that tells us why we would expect to see this one species here and not there and so on and so uh that's way more in depth than a, a book opening a book with pretty pictures in it and uh of course, yours has the pr pretty pictures in it too. And, and then you mentioned that book about caterpillars. That's been a big breakthrough too, because it's always been yeah. difficult to identify, well, what adult does this go to? Well, if you're an entomologist, you figure out what it's eating and then you feed it and rear it. And hopefully you'll get an adult and then you can identify it. And so it's a, not a simple thing doing this, this research. So hats off yeah. to you, Phil on that. Um, uh, so there's a question about uh, a beetle-like critter swimming in the pool. I'm have, I have a feeling that it was a, uh, a paddle bug type of a thing. So it would be a hemipterin. Uh, so those hemipterins are, you know, there's, there's lots of them, but I know I've seen them around. Uh, and they look like a beetle. They're kind of hard shelled, but they are, they can, you know, they swim pretty well too. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so the, the beetle is the adult uh, for that comment. And then uh, Megan Glenn. So the other thing that's interesting, Phil, is uh, two of our class members are in Texas. Wow. And in the, uh, just north of Houston, and uh, they they have property here, and they're moving here. But they, you know, since we're zooming, they're here, they're with us. And then uh, Diane is in Ohio, and taking the class too. And she shared her permaculture uh, work with us last Friday too. So very, you know, this Zoom thing hasn't been all bad because uh, we're able to do a lot of things and uh, and share from farther areas. I just thought I'd share that back with you, Phil. Wow. Um, uh, so I think we're, uh, I've gotten to most of the comments, but um, I wanted to go back to kissing bugs because 
um, you know, Phil was covering some ground, but the reason that they call them kissing bugs is that often, at least the species that we have here in Arizona, when they bite somebody, they bite them in their sleep and it's usually close to their mouth. Hmm. And uh, so, there, and, and some people, especially after they've been bit by them more and more and more, they react more and more severely to it. Uh, and it's like a red sore or something that develops from this bite and probably from bacteria and other things that are in the, the insect saliva. Yeah. But, but there's also been discussions about the, how these different species behave and some of them defecate in the wound that they've created. And that's how they figure Chagas disease is, is spread. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that that's not the entire story. But the huh. reason I bring up kissing bugs again, and Phil, I'll, I'll leave some space for you here. But if you have pack rats around your house, those pa and if you do don't know what a pack rat nest looks like, it's a pile of sticks that's two or three feet high or bigger that usually has some fresh cactus pads or something else and and then you're experiencing maybe some things disappearing from your yard uh that's what the pack rats or wood rats all, they're also known as do but here um it's pretty common that you find a lot of kissing bugs in pack rat nests because uh a lot of the native kissing bugs use the pack rat as a host so uh, any, any other uh, thoughts about kissing bugs, Phil, uh, or just because another- Yeah, no, I guess, I guess that's, that's, that's it. I would just say that the, the, the one that vectors Chagas, so far we don't know um, if it's here, we don't think it is, but those other three, once again, that I mentioned, and I'm sure those are found in pack rat nests. It's, that, it's not that we know that they don't vector, it just hasn't been determined. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And uh, the kissing bugs are also attracted to light. So, you know, if um, the, the big answer for scorpions, kissing bugs, all of these uh, blood feeders and kinds of things, with the exception probably of bed bugs and a few others, just uh, good caulking, good weather stripping, you know, goes a long way. Uh, and screens, I mean, and, and if you're in an area that has no seams, there's types of screens now that are a little bit better for them. And uh, and no seams are just another type of fly, correct, Phil? Mm -hmm. A very small fly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Verde Valley, I know I've been hit by no seams along the riparian areas almost every time I'm over there in the summer. Um, and uh, the bites can be kind of painful, especially if you scratch them. Um, and I don't know how many people were feeling itchy during the presentation. That's <laughs> a very common thing. Um, but the more the, you work with it around insects and understand it, it, it's like that part goes away and the fascination uh, overtakes you. I promise you. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, you know, uh, we were talking about lace wings and we were talking about ladybugs and, and uh, biocontrol using those, you know, greenhouse operations uh, use those a lot more effectively, I believe, um, because it's a confined Absolutely. space and, but still they can escape, but at least when they're inside there, it works pretty well. But um, when they ship lace wings to you, they often ship the larva. And the because I I ordered them years ago and played around with them at a at a hospital I was the gardener at, but um, what I found and I, I'd like to hear your comments about this, Phil, is that like when the aphids are just really going nuts in the springtime, the the ladybird beetles are are just a few days behind them and uh, <laughs> often build up their populations. There's that lag phase. And then uh, once they appear, the um, aphid problems get a lot less. I, um, you're ex I would never buy ladybird beetles uh, and I've never seen the larvae available uh, simply because they can fly. But um, the lace wings, I I'm not sure if there is quite a aggressive predator as the, the ladybird beetle larva. Uh, what's your thought there, Phil? 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, you know, once again, you mentioned lace wings are really uh, have been used more effectively in greenhouses. And, and I, I think I've seen that also with um, uh, predatory mites for, for mice, it's the same thing. But uh, you're never going to, I mean, I, I'm not aware of aphid outbreaks in greenhouses, maybe, but um, yeah, with the labored beetles, they, they're really flighty. Yeah. They're just, they're there and they come and then they go and they don't, they don't stay put. You're, yeah. you're just lucky to have them in there. Right. Um, and people find them, they'll go to the top of a mountain somewhere and you'll see them aggregating in the hottest parts of summer and they'll bring them home and go, uh, Oh, I've struck gold here. Don't do that. Just leave them be because <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they aren't they aren't going to hang around your house if they wanted to be on that mountaintop unless your house is on that mountaintop. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, um, there's things to think about there. Um, grasshoppers uh, and, and somebody uh, was there a comment about blister beetles that I missed? I think there might have been. Uh, just a lot of stuff in the chat box here. But, um, you know, blister beetles, uh, we do see them. Uh, there's several species that we see. And um, some of the entomologists down at the Maricopa Ag Center have put together some nice resources about them. Uh, but when they're really thick here, people call our offices and say, oh, they're all over my horse's watering trough. And if my horse eats one or two of these, it could kill them. Horses don't eat live blister beetles very often. It, I just haven't seen that. It's when they're in that hay field and then the hay is harvested, they allow it to dry and then they crimp the hay and they crush the blister beetle. And now those crushed blister beetles are part of that hay bale. And that's where they've seen horse toxicity primarily. It's not from the beetles that are flying around doing their own thing in the summertime. But they do aggregate, um, and sometimes they aggregate on garden plants. I've seen and heard lots of things about them. And the different species have different preferences. And as Phil pointed out, they have different amounts of the toxic chemical cantharidin in them. So anyway, I don't, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add to that, Phil, or comment on. No, you got it. You covered it. Yeah, so um, I was mentioning after break uh, that I, I have a copy of that book that Phil showed us called Bugs Rule uh, in my office. And you're, you know, when the office is open, you're more than welcome to come and use our libraries. But uh, if you joined us a little later, he has another book called Garden Insects of North America that's really helpful for I, ID and then management. And Phil, have you ever met Whitney? Um, no, I've, I've, I've been to talks, but I don't think I've ever talked with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a well-known extension entomologist. He's been at Colorado <clears throat> State for years and years and years. Kind of a colorful character. He's the guy that'll wear red high-top tennis shoes. Uh, and, you know, he has long white hair and a, a beard and, you know, um, like Phil, a very flamboyant guy. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Phil. <laughs> no, he's um, entomologists are all over the place. Phil is one of the more conventional uh, behaving entomologists that I've run into. A lot of these, you know, there's, you can attest to it, right, Phil? There's a lot of kind of crazy entomologists out there. Idiosyncratic, to say the least. <laughs> Idiosyncratic, a very kind word. And, um, <laughs> We used to have an uh, entomologist kind of like that, Carl Olson. But um, now going back to Whitney, these books that he's written and the stuff that he publishes, and I often go to the Colorado State University websites because he's done a lot of fact sheets too, like the Colorado potato beetle. And it's exhaustive information that he provides. And not only is you know, he's a colorful character, but he's, he's very academically sound too. And so um, in the West, uh, he's the legend. He came and spoke at one of our conferences, probably, it was probably 10 years ago now. Hmm. And so uh, anyway, uh, watching for a chance to attend one of his talks is always, you know, something interesting, especially for master gardeners. But um, I'm, I'm thinking that I have pretty much exhausted um, 
the notes that I have uh, that I was just making while Phil was talking. Um, are, are there any additional, uh, will I put a list of those books uh, on the resource section? I'm not sure that I will, uh, simply because we have the books in our offices. Now, if you'd like them in your libraries, uh, let me think about that. And it, it wouldn't take too much to do that. But, you know, these books are, um, you know, 60. I see. Yeah, 60 or so dollars a lot of times each. The field guide's not so much. Uh, we have a Peterson guide, but quite honestly, the Peterson guide, there are just so many insects that, well, I'll share this story. Carl Olson was the entomologist, uh, the curator of the collection at U of A when I first started. And I go, what book do I need? And he goes, man, you need an entire library. <laughs> because, you know, if we went to Phil's house, he'd have a library. I know it. <laughs> and um, so uh, I, I think, Whitney, yeah, there it is. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Uh, no, um, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the electronic forms of information nowadays, too, are, you know, are numerous as well. Um, let me see what I can do about listing a few of those. And, and uh, Mary's probably listening. We, I don't think we have a copy of Kaufman. So maybe those will be some of the next things that we get for resources. Yeah, I don't think we do either. The one that we use a lot is the Whitney Cranshaw. Yeah. You, got, you had this one, the Caterpillars? Uh, we don't. And we don't need to get so. that one too. This is 30 bucks. This one is 19. Yeah. More so you know. Yeah. Uh, because as we've said, thanks, Phil, as we've said, you know, identifying this insect is the first step to getting further with it. And we have a class coming up on integrated pest management. I introduced you all to it a little bit last week when we talked about weeds. But really, it's a process and identifying that insect is so critical. And it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Um, so um, I'm not seeing a lot of new questions coming along and I don't want to keep everyone uh, for, you know, for no reason at all. Uh, next week we, uh, well, let me begin first. Uh, I'll, so Phil might not have heard this yet, but I am doing office hours with class this year on Fridays. Uh, just so that uh, we can add some value to the class and have some discussion. And it's only a few people have been taking us up on it, but we've had some really nice uh, extracurricular conversations. And um, I will be available to do that. I don't have a, a date re to share with you for when we might go to Charlotte Hall Museum, but I'm thinking it will probably be on a Friday morning uh, but I need to communicate with them. And I know not everybody can come, especially those in Texas and Ohio, but um, <laughs> unless you want to buy a plane ticket. But um, anyway, uh, we'll, I'm, I'm going to work on that. I meant to try and get down there and talk to them yesterday, and it just got too busy. So next week, we're going to be talking about native ecosystems, native plants, um, we probably will have some flexibility to cover some other topics that day too. So uh, we'll maybe have some discussion time then. But other than that, Phil, I really want to thank you again for sharing your knowledge with us. And it's really hard to, you know, do the applause thing and all that via Zoom. <laughs> but um, yeah, see people that we're learning, you've got a few little applause signs there. And uh, but I, I just appreciate you, and, and I think everybody here, I'll just remind you all that Phil's among our ranks as a master gardener here, too, so it's, uh, but uh, Phil does a lot of things, thanks, Phil, uh, with the Highland Center for Natural History, uh, his, his book, um, other things, and so chances are you'll get a chance. Do you work with the Natural History Institute, too, Phil? I have, yeah, I have yeah. a little bit with them. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's kind of this uh, orbit that we all cir circulate in. Uh, and so we'll probably, uh, people will run into you again, Phil. And I just so much appreciate you sharing your experience and knowledge with us today. But thanks for your time, you guys. Appreciate three and a half hours. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we knew it was. And, and anyway, this kind of discussion is kind